On the ground, the flashy feet of Tony Dorsett will carry the cowboy load. Oh, Campbell and his powerful pistons will provide Houston with their spark. Both teams feature rock rip defenses. Holding forward on Houston's right side is all pro linebacker Robert Brazil. But for Dallas, the familiar face of number 56, Thomas Hollywood Henderson, will be missing from the lineup. We'll have more on that later. Cowboy and Oilers fans have been pointing towards this show's Lone Star showdown for quite some time, so hang on to your hats. It's Dallas versus Houston. We'll have that and a lot, lot more today on NFL 79. NBC Sports presents NFL 79, an inside look at professional football and a preview of today's game. Brought to you by the new 1980 Volkswagen Rabbit, Nasher, and Scirocco. Volkswagen does it again. And by these fine products from G. Heilman Brewing Company, La Crosse, Wisconsin, and other cities. Thanksgiving, everyone. I'm Mike Adamley here in Texas Stadium on a brisk but sunny afternoon in Dallas, Texas. And the atmosphere, if you cannot feel it well, it's absolutely electric. And why not? The state championship of Texas is on the line. My partner, Brian Gumbel, is holding Ford in New York. Brian, your perceptions. Well, Mike, first off, happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you. Before my perceptions, I'm full of questions. First one off, Dante Pastorini suffered an eye injury last week. What's his condition? They took an eye patch off of his eye on Tuesday. He is healthy, and he will start. The Dallas Cowboys have lost three of their last four, winning their only one in the last four weeks by just two points in the final play. What's their mental condition? I don't think they've ever been more ready mentally. The adversity has brought them together. Okay, third question is, Hollywood Henderson, number 56, been dominating the news out of Dallas. What have you been able to learn about him? Well, if the Hollywood Henderson scenario was a Western movie, it might be entitled, This Town Ain't Big Enough for the Both of Us. Last week against Washington, no tackles, no assists, but it was his antics off the field that uh, turned coach Tom Landry and many of his teammates, including D.D. Lewis, against him. Well, Dee Lewis is uh, a very prejudiced individual. You know, he's a no-talent linebacker. He's been in the league 11 years, and only presses ever got, only honors ever got was talking about me. So somebody that little doesn't bother me. We were in Washington. Nobody liked us up there. All the fans, we were getting beat. We needed everybody on the side pulling together, helping the guys that are on the field. I didn't feel that from Thomas. I, I think that uh, uh, he didn't feel anything at all up there. Cliff Harris played football good years ago. <laughs> I'm just saying that people you know, talk about me need to sit back and evaluate themselves. And quit trying to point a finger and say he was our problem. The demands you were talking about that Coach Landry made on you, you described them as unique. Were you treated different than other Cowboy players, do you believe? Well, I think that I had, I think that I had to do the same thing everybody else did, but under, 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 the, under the, the watchful eye. What did you mean when you said that the Cowboys organization has a tradition of doing this sort of thing? If you don't believe me, you can ask Dwayne Thomas, Gene Fugit, or Bob Hayes. Or Craig Morton, uh, Montgomery, uh, uh, Pete Gent. I mean, just, yeah, it, it's, it's traditional. No player plays forever. And there's always a point in his career, like Golden Richards, you get traded. Uh, like Doug Dennison, you get cut. Like Todd Christensen, you get cut. You work hard in the offseason. Uh, so you never know what you have to do to be a Dallas Cowboy. With Thomas Hollywood Henderson out of the lineup, Mike Hegman will get a start against the Oilers today. Already today, this ball game has been going on late in the fourth quarter. A surprise, the Lions out in front of the Bears, 20 to nothing at Pontiac. Walter Payton came into the game. He has been treated roughly, very roughly, by the Detroit defense. Take a look at this. Walter has carried 18 times, just 54 yards. By contrast, quarterback Jeff Comlow has been having a terrific day, over 240 yards passing. Here he hits Leonard Thompson, who fights his way down into the end zone for a score. 
And then in the fourth quarter, from the goal line, Rick Kane takes it over. Detroit out in front, 20 to nothing, going for their first ever Thanksgiving Day shutout. Four weeks ago, we had a look at a most unusual coach, part two of a very human story, right after this. You can play most all the video games you've ever wanted to play. It's the video game system from Sears. You can play up to 371 video games, all on cartridges. This cartridge of 27 target games comes with it. And now the video game system from Sears is only $139.99. A super value for Christmas. Sears, where America shops for value. Monsieur, why are you driving a Volkswagen Rabbit? Because it is so French. But the Rabbit isn't a French car. Not a French car. French. I don't get it. She's very rapid. She handles extraordinaire, and she's chic. Chic. The Rabbit's just a good basic car. Oui, and the souffle is just eggs. Volkswagen does it again. God's country is home to the majestic eagle, one of the few places left where this proud bird still thrives and enjoys air that is pure and water that runs crisp and clear. God's country is also home to old style. Receive responses about features we do on NFL 79. Perhaps none more positive than the ones we received about a touching story concerning a high school coach. This being Thanksgiving Day, let's look back. Earlier this season, we visited Morgan, Utah to profile a high school coach named Jan Smith. Jan is a 29-year-old former collegiate running back who seven years ago learned he had multiple sclerosis, a degenerative disease with no known cure. But Jan believes coaching is done with the mind and not the body. So he perseveres with the love of his daughters and the literal support of his wife, Diane. If you have something, don't put it second. Set it high and achieve it. Don't take second best to anything. And he's taught me that. He has given me courage in myself if I want something to go after it. He says, I hold you back from things you could do, but he really doesn't. Because this is what I want. I don't know how she's done it, to be honest with you. She may at times live the, the agony, I guess, uh, more closely than I do myself. She does everything for me. She's my number one assistant. Sometimes she's even the head coach. But I think she also realizes that football is a big part of my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah! Since we first visited with Jan Smith, the Morgan High Trojans have torn through their schedule like a tiny tornado. 11 opponents, 11 straight victories. And Jan Smith has gained strength from each one. So it comes down to this final moment, the Utah Class 2A State Championship. Morgan High has gone through the season undefeated, 11-0. However, their opponent this afternoon, Millard High School, has won 25 consecutive games. You know, Morgan's not the biggest or fastest high school team in the country, but they are definitely a reflection of their coach. And for Jan Smith this afternoon, it's not just a quest for the state championship. It's the biggest day of his life. Okay, a few things. Personal best today. This has got to be your best game you've ever played in your whole life. Okay? We're not up for this one. We won't be up for anything the rest of our lives. Personal best. Make this every play, every single play, be the best play you've ever played. Hey, we've got to get on Millard right away. Every man has got a responsibility. You guys have provided a lot of joy for me. I've loved every minute with you guys this whole season. You guys are going to come off the field winners today. But I could give a crap what happens in a ball game. I love each and every one of you guys. And you guys mean a lot to me. That's my whole life. You guys are the whole thing. We play a game like we did last week, gentlemen. You'll be state champions, 1979. Hi!
fell behind early, but Jan Smith and his determined players had come too far to be turned back now. Now listen, tell the damn quick tackle that he's got to make his block. That's what screwed it up last time. Okay, I'll take it down! Go, 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 on, go, 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 Congratulations on Morgan's first undefeated high school season, man. Thanks a lot. Not a bad feeling, huh? Great feeling. Great feeling. Congratulations. Today, Bob Hayes was an all-pro. Now number 22 is a man behind bars. A look at his life as it is today when we come back. Me as a Dallas Cowboys hero, past and present. Bob Hayes as past receiver, Bob Hayes as prisoner. Perhaps because we like to remember our heroes without the human imperfections, the story of Bob Hayes is a particularly difficult one to retell. Thanksgiving's the time of year when you kind of gather the family around the dining room table and count your blessings. But at this prison in Midway, Texas, there'll be no family gatherings. There are 2,000 inmates in there. One of them is number 290273. Does it ring a bell? How about number 22, formerly of the Dallas Cowboys, Bob Hayes. In 1964 at the Tokyo Olympics, Bob Hayes set a world's record in the 100 meters to become the world's fastest human. One year later, he made the all-pro team as a rookie for the Dallas Cowboys, 1,000 yards in receptions, 12 TDs. For 10 years, Bob Hayes terrorized NFL defensive backs. He retired in 1974. In 1979, he was sentenced to five years in prison for selling illegal drugs to an undercover narcotics agent. It's the all too familiar story of the rise and the fall of a professional athlete. Basically, you're living a real good life. You know, you, you got a lot of money in your pocket. Uh, you got a lot of money in the bank. You know, you're living in the best of hotels. You're eating the best of food. Uh, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, you can't eat that food, you can't, you know, you can't go and take a shower and throw the, the towel on the floor if you like. Uh, you can't get on an airplane and ride first class around the country. Uh, it, it's a completely different turnaround for me. Now, you know, everything that I do basically is, is supervision over me. Uh, folks that are looking at me, uh, of course, that I, I got to play a very vital part because these teenagers, everybody, everything I do around here, they got their eyes on me. And you know, it's it just, uh, it, it's very difficult. When, once you're free, you basically, you're free to do what you like, but here, you know, you gotta be very particular. Bob Hayes revolutionized the game of pro football with blazing speed. The legs that carried him 100 meters to Olympic glory earned him the nickname Bullet Bob Hayes in football. Instead of medals, the rewards were touchdowns. In 10 years, 76 of them. Hayes' impact on pro football sent scouts hurrying to track meets, and while sprinters like Henry Carr, Jim Hines, Frank Budd, and Earl McCullough all played professionally, they could not measure up to Bullet Bob's success. He went on to become the leading scorer and receiver in Dallas history. Number 22 helped Dallas win their first Super Bowl and put a rare smile on the face of coach Tom Landry. When the Cowboys celebrated their 20th anniversary earlier this season, Hayes was granted permission to attend. It was a special privilege, one he does not often ask for. But uh, I would have not asked for any special treatments. You know, I'm, I'm a big boy. I'm grown. I can handle the situation and that uh, I wouldn't want any. Uh, this is a real, this is a, a lesson for me and that uh, I have adjusted to it and I'm just uh, deep down, I'm, I'm very satisfied the way I have reacted and how I have adjusted to society. Hayes was one of the most popular and well-liked cowboys. His conduct was beyond reproach. Thus, the announcement of his arrest stunned the organization, especially Tom Landry. I was really disappointed. I, I was really kind of shocked that 
that he would let himself fall into a situation which is obviously you could have prevented very easily. Bobby Hayes, as long as he was in our organization, uh, there was no reason to ever believe that he would ever come across the law at any time because he was a fine person. I believe there's a, always a silver lining in every cloud and that uh, I believe I can come out and handle it. I, I paid the price of what have happened and I, you know, you just can't continue to, you know, to stick someone in the back because they made a mistake. No one is perfect. I feel that I can get, I get a better reaction out there now than I did before. I tell you, I'm just yeah. as popular with something negative that have happened to me than I were when I was when it was all positive. It's very difficult when you have been idolized, you know, like Bobby Hayes has, as a track man, as a football player, and then all of a sudden uh, you're an ex-con, uh, which is not really something that is easy to handle. I believe that Bobby will over will come through on the thing because I think he'll have a, a lot of friends that will help him, you know, to get over those hurdles that he's going to have to face when he comes out. And uh, we just all wish him the best, really. Bob Hayes can file for parole in February, but there's no guarantee that it'll be granted. In any event, once he gets out, the road back to society is a long run. But then long runs are one thing Bob always did best. Houston and Dallas pro football franchises were born in 1960. A trip down memory lane, Texas style, when we come back. 1960, it might have been a rout. Houston was the kingpins in the old AFL. Dallas struggled in the NFL. Both teams today are on top, although their organizations took markedly different routes to get there. Way back in 1960, when the American Football League was formed, one of the new clubs was the Houston Oilers, the team that put the AFL on the map. In those days, nobody really knew for sure whether or not the new league was going to make it. But there wasn't a football fan alive who didn't enjoy watching Oiler greats like Billy Cannon, George Blander, Charlie Hennigan, and Willard Duval. Yes, sir, they was exciting. And mean? Why, them old Oilers were nastier than a coyote in a hen house. A real shoot 'em up bunch. And there wasn't nobody who did more to enhance that rough and tumble image than that little human cannonball, Charlie Tola. Well, I don't think the owner contributed to it, you know. We felt like that we was, uh, any ballroom we got in, we could take care of ourselves, though. But, uh, and we've been in a few ballrooms, you know, I'll tell you, but this. We just felt like we could, uh, whether it be in a bar room on the football field, that we could uh, take care of ourselves and, uh, and accomplish what we set out to do when we first walked in there. Charlie and his boys played ball in old Jefferson Stadium, but they didn't have it all to themselves, because in those days they shared it with the Houston area high schools. I recall when we had our 20-year reunion that all the players came out to take another team picture here at Jefferson Stadium, and. One of the most unusual things that all the players and myself commented on it was that the field had some grass on it. And it was, uh, it was great to see grass. We'd have loved to know what it'd be like to play on in grass. I can recall in one of our championship games, they came out and to get a little more color for television reasons, they even came out and painted the dirt green. For Charlie Tola, a visit to Jefferson Stadium is like a stroll down memory lane to a time when the Oilers was the kingpins of Texas football. We felt like at that time we were the premier team, definitely of the AFL, and Dallas was, you know, they were just beginning. No, it's no doubt we'd want to play them in, you know. They, they were a pure bunch of mullets back in those days. <laughs> Come to think of it, the Dallas Cowboys didn't exactly tear up the league their first few years, as one old cowboy remembers. The year I came, we had a very impressive record. We started playing 14 games, and. I think we won three, tied one, and, and lost ten. But uh, you knew that Coach Leonard knew what he's talking about. The coach probably did know what he was trying to say in those huddles, but when the players mapped it out, something invariably got lost in the translation. It wasn't easy being a Cowboy fan back then. 
that, Landry was patient, just like a banker. Kept invested in those fine young college players till one day his account yielded big dividends. That was in Super Bowl VI, the day Bob Lilly and his herd stampeded the Dolphins right out of Tulane Stadium. Since then, Landry's bunch has been in a whole mess of Super Bowls, and they just might go back again this year. Wouldn't it be something if the other hat tossed in that Super Bowl ring was 10-gallon? Two Texas teams in the Super Bowl, well, we're just going to play it in Austin. We're not going to play it in California. We're just going to vote to play it in Austin. Because if it's only Texas people playing it, you might as well have it where the Texas people can see them. I said, if you think we're obnoxious now, you ought to let that happen, and you'd find out how obnoxious Texas people can be. I think Bum Phillips is right. Some Texans might be tough to live with if it was a Houston-Dallas Super Bowl. But, Michael, I get the feeling down there that the players considered this day a Super Bowl. No question about it. You know, all week long, uh, the nation has been questioning Dallas's character. This afternoon will be a real gut check for the Cowboys, and I think they'll respond. Okay, Michael, thank you very much. Enjoy the game. Mike and I will be back with you at halftime and after the game, but it's that time again. Time for us to step aside and give way to two other gentlemen in Texas, Dick Enberg and Merlin Olson. Happy Thanksgiving, gents. The eyes of Texas and the nation are on this key NFL game featuring two first-place teams, Houston and the AFC Central tied with Super Bowl champion Pittsburgh. Cleveland just one game back. Host Dallas, after two straight defeats, finds itself in a three-way tie for first with the Redskins and the Eagles. So plenty at stake today at Irving, Texas, Texas Stadium. Hello, everyone. Dick Enberg with Merlin Olson, and a happy Thanksgiving to you. A day of tradition and sentiment and warmth and family and all the things apply to this game today. It's a game of emotion, and perhaps uh, these two teams as high as they'll be all season long. A lot of emotion in the locker room, but, but still time for the players on both teams, a number of them, to say, be sure and wish my family or my mom and dad a happy Thanksgiving. They didn't forget the families, and they want some turkey saved, by the way, too, if you could do that. But tremendous emotion, Dick. This is a natural AFC-NFC rivalry. There's part of that, then the Houston-Dallas rivalry, the Texas championship. You have the build from that. The fact that 26 other teams are watching, their peers are watching at home, a national television game. Tremendous emotion building on that, and also some natural animosity between these two teams. I think especially on the side of Houston. They feel like they've been treated like poor relatives for a long time. They'd like to have some revenge for that. They'd like their day in the sun today. Well, they have a better record going in, and this is a Thanksgiving football game uh, complete with all the trimmings. And in one area, well, some of the very best morsels that uh, you'd want to sample, running back. Number 34, Earl Campbell, to lead the Houston Oilers, NFL's top rusher last year. The big guy from Texas, the power to run over people, the speed and the agility to get around them and break the long gainer. Earl Campbell is not the only great runner on this field. Tony Dorsett only needs 91 yards to become the second back in the history of the NFL ever to top 1,000 yards in his first three years. He'll not run over you, but he will run away from you, and he's tough to catch. And at quarterback for the Houston Oilers, Dan Pastorini hit in the eye in the game Sunday against Cincinnati. Although it looks ugly, he's going to be all right. They say he's throwing the football better than he has since this summer. That complements the running game of Campbell. On the other side, Roger Staubach, 37 years old, can still hurt you almost as much running as he can throwing the football. Great mobility and a great quarterback. Thomas Henderson also part of the story, but one thing for sure, the players have pointed out, whoever wins can be thankful today. They'll stay in first place. It's been termed a desperate Dallas against a confident Houston. Executive producer, Don Olmeyer. It's a pleasure for me today to have an opportunity to wish all of you a, a very happy Thanksgiving from the Dallas Cowboy team and, and our organization. For all the people that are not fortunate enough to live in the state of Texas, I'd like to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. And from all of us at NBC Sports, a happy, warm Thanksgiving hello from Irving, Texas. Dick Enberg with Marilyn Olson. We're pleased to join us. Tom Landry's Dallas Cowboys have lost two in a row. Against the Houston Oilers, Bum Phillips has his team headed toward the playoffs. 
and the bum in his usual sectorial attire with his cowboy hat and his boots on the sideline. A cool day here in Dallas, Dick, and some great football weather, the kind of day you love to play on because you can literally run all day. Tony Frisch, who started his NFL career after coming here from Austria with the Dallas Cowboys, now kicking for the Houston Oilers, will send it deep to Steve Wilson, 81, Ron Springs, number 20, two rookies for the Cowboys. A game on which you can measure much of this NFL season and the hopes of both teams heading toward possible playoff spots. A sidewinder that skips to Springs. Springs from Ohio State at the 15. He's out to the 25, and there, buried in the Columbia blue of the Houston Oilers, spearheaded by Guido Merkins, number 12. The Cowboys take the field with the veteran Roger Staubach at quarterback. Tony Dorsett and Robert Newhouse in the backfield. Wide receivers, veteran Drew Pearson, Tony the Thrill Hill, and at tight end, Billy Joe Dupre. Cowboys have played the Oilers only twice in the regular season and have won both. Sabak throws on first down. He hits Pearson. Tackled immediately at the 31. It's a gain of five. J.C. Wilson, left corner, made the hit for the Oilers. Let's check that Dallas offensive line. Pat Donovan at left tackle. Herb Scott, left guard. Dennis Robert Shaw, the rookie, is at center. Could be a key position for Dallas today. Tom Rafferty at right guard. And the veteran big cat, Rayfield Wright, starting at right tackle for Jim Cooper. Second and five for Staubach, the number one passer in the National Football League on the rating system. On second and five, it's Dorsett. Fine move by Dorsett using his speed to drive near a first down across the 35. Greg Stembrick finally corralled him. You talked about that key matchup in there between Shaw and Culp. Culp gets around nicely, but watch him here as he misses a tackle. What should have been an easy tackle on Tony Dorsett. Dorsett makes the most of it. Number 33 breaks away for the first down or what appears to be first down yardage. We have our first official measurement of the day, and while they measure for a Dallas first down or not, let's check the defensive alignment for the Oilers. It is not a first down third and inches. The Oilers set up defensively in that 3-4 front. With Andy Doris at left end, Curly Culp at the nose guard, and Elvin Bethay at right end. Four linebackers, Ted Washington, Greg Bingham, rookie Daryl Hunt, and Robert Brazil. J.C. Wilson at one corner, Greg Stemrick at the other, and the safeties for the Oilers, Vernon Perry, and the man who leads the NFL in interceptions, Mike Reinfeld. He has 12 in the first 12 games. That 12 is one more than the entire Dallas team with 11. An amazing stat for that young man. Third and less than a yard. Jay Saldi in motion. Newhouse has running room. 40. And he's all the way to the 44. A gain of nine. First down, Dallas. Robert Newhouse, the third cowboy to rush for more than 4,000 yards in a career. Some concern here in Dallas about the output of that fullback position. Newhouse has been injured during part of this year. He's splitting time with Scott Laidlaw. You just saw Laidlaw coming into the game, running the plays in from the sideline. If Dallas can run the football, and they've started out running well, they can give Houston all they want today, Dick. Merlin, we refer to Dallas as being a desperate team. That seems strange for Club 8 and 4, but they've really had their problems of late, and there's a much concern in the camp of Dallas. Staubach to throw. Going deep. Drew Pearson is open. Touchdown. Staubach to Pearson. Dallas scores. There is no more beautiful play in all of football than the long bomb. And Drew Pearson and Roger Staubach have teamed up to form 
one of the best combinations in the NFL. At least there's nothing more beautiful for Dallas fans. Not nearly so pretty for the Houston Oilers. But look at this perfectly thrown pass and look at the range that he opened up on J.C. Wilson. Drew just pulled away beautifully, spikes it into the end zone. Six points, they'll go for the seventh. Pearson in his 99th consecutive game gets the bomb. Here's Raphael Septien's kick. It's good. So the Cowboys take the kickoff and score immediately on a stop off to Pearson pass. Seven to nothing Dallas. Quick look at Drew Pearson. He just runs right past J.C. Wilson, who apparently could not believe that they were just going to run it up on him. But there it is. It's almost too easy, and I'm sure that's something that will concern Tom Landry a little bit. He wants his team to sustain that kind of emotion throughout this game. 56 yards for the touchdown, Drew Pearson. Just underway, two minutes gone. Dallas leads 7-0. Roger Staubach, the veteran from Navy, has thrown a long touchdown pass. Dallas leads 7-0, just two minutes plus gone as Septien kicks it off. Carter Hartwig at the 10. Rookie from USC breaks out at the 25 and down at the 30. The tackle made by Aaron Kyle, number 21 for Dallas. Dan Pastorini takes his team onto the field, and with him in the backfield, the great second-year man from Texas, Earl Campbell, and the blocking back, Tim Wilson of Maryland. Wide receivers, veteran Richard Castor on one side, Ken Burrow, double zero on the other, with a tight end, Mike Barber. Pastorini shooting at 49% on the season. Slips at the 33. It'll be second and seven. And had he stayed on his feet, there was just one man to run over, and you know Big Earl can do that. Offensive line blocking for Pastorini and Campbell. Left to right along that front, Leon Gray, the former Patriot at left tackle. Conway Heyman at left guard. The veteran center is Carl Mock. On the right side, Ed Fisher and Morris Towns. Second down, call it a short seven. Pastorini's first throw complete to the tight end Barber, rocketed out of bounds at the 38-yard line, short of a first down. Randy Hughes came over from his safety spot to make the hit. Third down and uh, about a yard and a half for Houston. John Dutton makes his first start as a Baltimore uh, from Baltimore now with Dallas. Larry Cole moves inside at left tackle. Larry Bethay at right tackle. And Harvey Martin, top pass rusher on the right side for Dallas. The linebackers for the Cowboys and the deep backs will check for you. Third down, a lesson two. Campbell, first down and more. 50, 40, 30, 20. Touchdown, Houston. Oh my, what a start to this one. 61 yards for Campbell. A tremendous offensive, offensive explosion by Dallas to start the game, and Houston answers the call. Earl Campbell, 61 yards down the sideline, and that man with all of his strength just ran away from the Dallas defense. Campbell in short yardage, and once he broke through, he still had the speed to beat the defensive backs. The danger of short yardage always, you stack your people at the line of scrimmage, and if you break clean, you really have to run them down from behind. No one was going to catch Earl Campbell on that play. That's the longest run this year by the Oilers. Tony Frisch into the fading sun, and he hits it right down the middle. So Staubach to Pearson. 56 yards. Earl Campbell counters with a 61 yard gallop. And here in Irving, Texas, we played three minutes, 18 seconds, and both teams have seven. So an electrical start here on this Thanksgiving day. In the Dallas area, Tony Frisch. Cowboys at the other end are Steve Wilson, Ron Springs, Earl Campbell. What a player. Deep to spring. Short.
short hops it. Picks it at the six. To the 21 yard line goes Ron Springs. It'll be Dallas starting at that point. Let's go back to the touchdown by Campbell and look at the blocking in front of number 34. Mike Barber, number 86, right there gets it started with a fine block on Dee Dee Lewis. Ed Fisher, number 60, comes out, shields Bob Brunick, 53, and from there on out, it's all Earl Campbell, and he just fires those big thighs of his down the field. What a tremendous touchdown. Seven plays, already two touchdowns, an explosive start to this Thanksgiving Day game. Dallas tied at seven, just underway, 11 and a half minutes left in the first quarter. Robert Newhouse. Gets out to about the 25-yard line. Robert Brazil, 52. And Greg Bingham, 54, two of the Houston linebackers in on the stop. The dean of the NFL coaches, Tom Landry, in his 20th year and perhaps never more perplexed since, oh, back in the early days when the Cowboys won rarely. Dick, I asked him, I said, what is wrong? You really have stumbled in the last four weeks. You were actually lucky by their own admission to win in that New York Giant game. He said, I wish I knew. I can't put my finger on it. Even the computer age isn't giving him the answers. Second down and six. Little trap, and it's Newhouse pulling his way near the 28-yard line. Culp and Brazil and company to make the tackle. It's short of the first down and brings up third and about three. We talked about a critical matchup in the center between Curly Culp and Robert Shaw. You see it right here. Shaw trying to turn Culp, but number 78 is battle-wise. Works right across his head and gets a piece, but Shaw, to his credit, stayed with Culp all the way, would not give up, and actually ended up neutralizing Curly, although the play does not go for the first down. It's going to be third and about three yards to go, Dick. Shaw, the rookie at center, that may take away some of that spread formation of the Cowboys that requires the blind snap done so well by John Fitzgerald who is injured. First down as Preston Pearson the oldest running back in the National Football League makes another reception what fine receiver he is. In an age of specialists the Dallas Cowboys are very happy to have number 26 back in the lineup. He spent a good part of the year injured but watch him here. He knows how to run defenses perfectly, and he runs some of the best pass patterns in football, finds the open spot. Greg Bingham, Bingham gets there, but too late, and it's a first down for the Dallas Cowboys. Hurt this year, Pearson with not his usual total. He caught 47 last year. First down, Dallas, 7-7 seven, seven tie, nine and a half minutes left first quarter. Ball at the 37, and it's Newhouse. He was stopped right at the line of scrimmage by Brazil was able to break out of his tackle and Colt downed him near the 40 yard line. Call it the 39 and make it to second and eight. Both of the lines for Dallas have come under pressure this year. The offensive line being criticized for not doing a better job of blocking. The defense being criticized for not getting the right amount of pressure on the passer. Rayfield Wright has gone back in to play right tackle. They feel that his leadership might help motivate that offensive line. Hill is to the left, Drew Pearson to the right. Newhouse and Dorsett behind Staubach. Complete to Dorsett, straightened immediately at the 45-yard line. Greg Stemrick and Greg Bingham made the sandwich stop. It'll be third and a long two. Very quick ball reaction from the Houston backfield, but Staubach is finding open receivers, and in spite of some very tough work going on on the line of scrimmage, he does have time to throw that football here early in the ballgame. And Staubach already facing Merlin Olson, his third third down situation. He passed for the first down the last time, and it was the run by Newhouse that kept the opening touchdown drive alive. Let's see what he calls on third and a long two from his 45. Houston 43 first down so Staubach is three for three. Staubach using Dorsett more and more as a receiver and trying to get the, the football into the hands of his best runner in the open field. Dorsett does an excellent job on this play finding himself open but good blocking to free up Roger to get in time for the to throw that football. Look how open Dorsett is turns up the sideline 
does make the first down. They're in Euler territory at the 43, 44 yard line, first and 10. And that play action really froze the line. They did not know where the ball was, as you saw in that replay. Pearson in motion. Delay handoff, and Newhouse, even with the confusion in the backfield, gets a couple of yards down to the Houston 41. And Staubach, as he walks back toward the huddle, head down, thinking that went over. That's not exactly how it was drawn up. Credit Elvin Bethea, number 65, with great penetration. Watch him coming in from the left side of your picture. He forces this man so deep that he puts the guard right into Newhouse. Actually knocked the guard down. That's what caused the confusion. Just a good defensive play. Newhouse does a fine job of getting back beyond the line of scrimmage. Actually picks up three yards on the play. Second down and seven. Both wide receivers to the right. And stop out to throw. Got him on their feet. He's got the emotion charged here in Dallas. Tom Landry said, what we need is a good win. We need an explosive performance to get back on track. Stavak is doing what he can. Boy, you can't throw that ball anymore perfectly. Greg Bingham had his hands up, just missed his fingers. Drew Pearson now has 46 catches. That ties him with Tony Hill. He married Marcus Haynes, the great dribbling globetrotter's daughter. And he's always had that facility to be open. He's as clever with his feet as his father-in-law was with his hands. First down at the 16, Tony Dorsett. At the five-yard line. And down inside the five. Flag is down. And that one might be called back the first penalty of the game. Tom Landry expressing some concern on the sideline. Uh, I'm sure he's very happy with the way this game has started out. Coach Landry said he kind of wished he'd have had a full week of preparation this week because he wanted to evaluate exactly what could be done to change the fortune of the Cowboys. Well, right now, what looked to be great field position has been marched back 10 yards. Here's referee Gordon McCarter. Gordon did work on his electronics. His microphone is inoperative. That is controlled by the National Football League. He was calling a holding penalty, however, and of course the ball moves back to the 25-yard line. Instead of having the ball inside the five, Stavik's going to have to work to get it into scoring territory. Pass situation, but they're not in the shotgun, and that may be because of the injury to Fitzgerald with a rookie Shaw over the ball. Up the middle, Dorsett. And he gets about four to the 21-yard line. That did not fool the Oilers. Having John Fitzgerald, their regular center, out of the lineup does put them at a disadvantage. Not only are they having to play a rookie at a critical position against Curly Culp, who's one of the tough, one of the toughest nose men in the league, but also you just can't afford to make a mistake out of that spread formation. Stavak is back, and in one earlier game, when Shaw got in, snapped the ball over his head, ended up in a touchdown for the other team. They certainly would not like to have that happen here. Shaw was the Cowboys' number one draft pick this year out of Tennessee. Second down, 15. From the 21. Screen, Newhouse, he's got running room. 20, 15, 5, touchdown! Executed. Not only beautifully executed, but they caught the Houston Oilers in exactly the wrong defense. It's a blitz by both outside linebackers, which takes away the opportunity to react quickly to this screen. And Newhouse sees the opening, takes it, makes a last cut there. That field looks a little slippery, but it didn't get him over, get, didn't get him down. He gets into the end zone. Raphael Septien in to try and make it 14 to 7. And wow. What fireworks here in Dallas. 21 yards, Newhouse untouched for the score. Except the end out of White's hold. And Dallas has seven more. Just under six minutes remaining in the first quarter. We had three touchdowns already. Dallas, 
14, Houston, 7. Roger Staubach has driven his team 74 and 79 yards for touchdowns in this first quarter and has thrown to Drew Pearson and Robert Newhouse to give Dallas 14-7 lead. Kickoff by 70 in. And out of bounds steps Carter Hartwig at the 14-yard line. That one as if it had eyes forced Hartwig right to the sidelines and even though he tried to elude the out-of-bounds marker, could not. Let's check the defense. Linebackers and deep backs for the Cowboys as they come on the field. We told you about the front four and a rebuilt front four with John Dutton starting for the first time. Mike Heckman for Tom Henderson at one linebacker spot. Bob Brunick, the middle backer, and on the right side, the veteran D.D. Lewis. Richard Castor slotted left. Kenver a wide left, first down at the 14. Campbell hit in the backfield, breaks a tackle, and bolts out to the 21-yard line. Randy Hughes finally downed him. A gain of seven for Campbell. Mike Heckman certainly must feel a great deal of pressure out on that field today, Dick. As you said, he is taking Henderson's place, and I'm sure a lot of attention focused on him right here the attention is focused on him by number 86 Mike Barber who does just a fine job of sealing him off to the inside and I'm sure that's not the way he pictured starting this second series Barber we caught him throwing two outstanding blocks already on that right side the tight end Barber they're glad to have him back in the lineup after hurting a knee earlier in the year second and three and this time it's Campbell burrowing out near the 24 yard line it'll be very close to a first down John Dutton an All-American at Nebraska and an All-Pro at Baltimore made the tackle. Defensive backs for the Dallas Cowboys, the men in the silver helmets and the blue stars are featured this way. Benny Barnes at the left corner and Aaron Kyle from Wyoming on the right side. The safeties, Randy Hughes and Cliff Harris, the veteran Harris, All-Pro four times. Cliffy Harris playing hurt too. He's got a problem with an arch, as a number of players are this late in the season. In fact, we've got a lot of them out there operating uh, without uh, totally uh, uh, being in control of those knees and elbows and arms and so forth. Talked about Mike Barber. He still has some instability in that knee. Cliffy Harris, a courageous football player, does not want to come out of that lineup. First down, Houston at the 24. 14 to 7, Dallas. Wilson in motion, play action. Pastorini's first throw, he's in trouble and throws it away. It was nearest to Earl Campbell, but that was just a matter of Pastorini unloading. John Dutton and Larry Bethea putting the pressure on Pastorini. Dick, you talked about the rebuilt front line. Right here, they get good pressure on Pastorini as Dutton breaks through, and you see him just necktying there along with Bethea, who got pressure. But uh, certainly one of the things that had to concern Tom Landry is that Dallas has not been able to put the kind of pressure on opposing quarterbacks that they wanted. Putting Dutton into the lineup, he's an excellent pass rusher, and also giving Cole a chance to move to his natural position at tackle may give them that added pressure. Barber, the tight end, splits right. Second and ten, it's Campbell off the left side, tried to spin loose, and fortunately for the Cowboys, D.D. Lewis had a latch on Campbell. Had he not been able to keep him there, Campbell had clear sailing to the outside. He just about got away. D.D. Lewis did get a hold of him, but man, Campbell, even with the, the force of that hit, literally was just pulling away, and it just took a tremendous amount of determination from D.D. By the way, he's one of the Cowboys that Tom Landry says has had the the best year of any of his defenders, along with Randy White, and they'll miss him in that lineup today. Randy's out with a foot injury. And D.D. Lewis, one of those that he would not miss, Thomas Henderson. That's Rob Carpenter short of the first down. He was nailed around the neck at the 34, and it appears to be just short of the first down. A flag goes down, and Carpenter may pick up a penalty for spiking the ball in anger at himself, I'm sure. He thought he had first down yardage and slipped. 
Dennis Thurman came up and really put a tough necktie tackle on Carpenter. He may have been aggravated at that too, Dick, but you're not allowed to spike that ball until the ball is dead. Could be that we uh, may have another kind of penalty. The Cowboys initially uh, seemed happy at the penalty call, but let's give the officials a chance to sort it out down there. Illegal procedure apparently against Houston. Gordon McCarter will get our NBC people down work on that mic. Got to wonder, uh, they're, they're coming off the field now. So either way, it's going to be fourth down. They did not pick up the first down with the play. If they take that, uh, certainly as they go back, and they will. What's, what's happening here? Well, it's after the play, so ah, the five yards okay. attack That's on the still fourth down. Here. All right. So the down will be, it does not give them a chance to have third down again. They'll have to kick it away. Fourth and about six. They lose the five yards. And that's the first time an offensive team has been stopped in this ball game. That's right. Dallas, two possessions, two touchdowns on long marches. Houston scored on the long run by Campbell of 61 yards. And now it is Cliff Parsley averaging just under 41 yards a punt. Kicking to Wilson and Springs back at the Dallas 30. Whoops. Number 77 for the Dallas Cowboys leaning in offside. That would be Bruce Thornton, Bruce the Thornton. Uh, youngster who I'm sure if that had gotten the first down for the Houston Oilers, that Tom Landry would have had a little conversation and Ernie Stottner would have had a little conversation with that young man. That's not a smart mistake. Some, mis well, no mistake is smart, but certainly that's not the kind of an error you want to make when things are going your way in a football game. Brings up fourth and a yard. Parsley, a little more field in his advantage. Wade Manning now has joined Steve Wilson deep for Dallas. Manning just activated when Henderson was released. Beautiful kick. Steve Wilson out to the 30 and brings it back to the 33-yard line. So Dallas has the ball again. 3.35 remaining in the first quarter at Irving, Texas. Beautiful Texas Stadium where the Cowboys on this Thanksgiving lead the Oilers 14-7. 3.35 left in the first quarter, 14-7 Dallas. It's normally about this time I'd be getting into a little of the dressing and cranberries. And I hope they'll save some for us, Dex, so. but... Uh, Certainly, we're getting our share of treats on the field today with an explosive start by both these teams. Pressure shifting now to the Houston Oilers defensive team. They'd like to stop Dallas, get another chance at that football. Right now, the Cowboys would like to keep going with their offensive surge. Staubach has moved very effectively. First two possessions to two touchdowns, long drives. He starts from the 33. Dorsett fumbles, and Houston has recovered. It appeared to be Daryl Hunt, the rookie from Oklahoma, falling on the loose ball. A flag is down, but I think that's against Dallas for illegal motion. Dick, when I talked to Tom Landry earlier, and he said he couldn't put his finger on why his team has had trouble, he said, I do know one thing. The normal plays that have been big plays for us just aren't falling together, and we have made critical mistakes. Now, here is one of those critical mistakes. Dorsett, who's made a couple of big plays, bumps into the quarterback, Staubach, right there. The ball popped loose. Just a, a very simple situation of handing that football off, and bam, turnover. Houston has an opportunity. Big play by the defense. Ball at the 32. Pass to Rainey to Campbell. Campbell wrestled down at the 30, and a flag is down as well. Going back to that turnover quickly, in the last four games plus this one, Dallas has gotten the ball once and have given it up 11 times. You can't survive on that kind of ratio. Not that kind of turnovers. We have a flag on the field. They're going to call Mo Towns for holding. So Houston has also had some critical mistakes during the year. In fact, during the early part of the season, we're plagued by, uh, there's our turnover table, Dick, in the last four games. The thing you talked about, 10 Dallas turnovers, and they've only taken the ball away once. Now That's it's a minus to nine. Now it's 11 to one. Uh, talking about now the Houston Oilers problem, earlier in the year, they had more holding penalties than they knew what to do with. Stopped all kinds of drives for them. And right now, they've just been assessed 10 yards. 
what looked to be a perfect opportunity to get back into this ball game, tie it up, uh, has not been erased, but Pastorini's going to have to work harder at it. First down 20 at the Dallas 42, three and a half minutes left first quarter. Mike Renfro, 82, is in for the first time. Screen to Burrow. Didn't work. Number 25, Aaron Kyle, made the tackle, but it was Harvey Martin that spoiled the play. Great pursuit from the inside. And if you want to see a hustling defensive lineman, you just watch Harvey Martin get out there to the inside. Now, on the outside, Kyle had taken the outside position away from Burrow. He couldn't go to the outside. Martin took away the inside position. I have to tell you, he said, we said, could you take off the hat, Harvey? He said, this is the way I look all the time. So we let him wear it. <laughs> when, he, when you're that size, Dick, you can look any way you want to look. You're doggone betcha. Second down, 20. From the 42, Pastorini going long, and Burrow is open. But the ball hits Kyle in the back, incomplete. Now, Renfro is arguing that Kyle had his hand in Burrow's face. That is illegal. You can be facing the receiver and not the ball, but you can't wave your hand in the eligible receiver's face. Well, he didn't wave his hand, and that saved him a penalty right here because he had completely lost Ken Burrow. Watch Burrow turn him around here. Kyle is driving right here. He does not know where that football is. Gets his hands up and whoo. I think you might be able to say he was waving or would you say he was just trying to get his balance? Well, the key though, Merlin, is that Pastorini had a man wide open and didn't, didn't throw it long enough. Pastorini has had arm trouble and even though he's throwing much, much better, he is still not getting the kind of fire on that ball that he's capable of. Third and 20, three wide receivers in. Pastorini in trouble. And a flag is down, so is Pastorini. And a little late hit by David Stahl, 65, in there for the pass rush. It appeared to be holding against Dallas, and the defense celebrates. Holding against Houston. Obviously, you don't take the penalty back there. You've already lost the yardage. Pastorini suffers from a lack of mobility. He took so many shots early in his career. In fact, I can remember when he could run as well as any quarterback around, but as he's just been beaten down and those legs have been torn up over a period of time, he does not move around well back there, and that's, that hurts his performance as a quarterback. Uh, Houston recovered Dorsett's fumble at the 32. Three plays later, it's fourth and 29 at their own 49. Parsley to kick. Beautiful high spiral. Wilson at the 10. The 11 and a flag is down as well. We had a clip. We Richard had a clip Ellender. Dallas. Richard Ellender, number 85, made the tackle even though he was clipped as he made the hit. 41 yard kick by the Oilers. This telecast presented by Authority of the National Football League, intended for the private use of our audience. Any rebroadcast or other use of this telecast without the express written consent of the Dallas Cowboys and the National Football League is prohibited. Well, certainly so far in this ball game, we would have to say that the Dallas Cowboys have responded to the challenge that uh, Tom Landry laid out for them. They had a defensive meeting earlier in the week, too, called by the veteran players, not attended by the coaches. We talked to D.D. Lewis uh, before the game, and he said uh, we had to sort some things out for ourselves. We knew that we were not playing as well as we were capable of playing. Right now, the Dallas defense is playing as well as the Dallas offense, which is awfully well early in this ball game. Your comment about Henderson, does that help the Cowboys or does it hurt them today? I, I think emotionally it may have brought them together. I think it may have brought them together. And I can't help but feel that maybe that was one of the things that motivated Tom Landry to make his decision. First down at the six for Dallas, leading 14 to seven. Shabak to Newhouse. Draws the crowd out around the eight yard line. We get official word from the press area that the fumble was not charged to Dorsett, but to Roger Staubach. Staubach charged with a fumble, not Dorsett. Houston recovered, but couldn't do anything with it. Well, that was an indication, really, that uh, Dorsett really didn't get a chance to take control of the football, which uh, which was uh, proven by our pictures, as you saw the fumble just being bounced off of his body by Staubach. And again, some of the simplest things can go wrong in all of the wrong places for you. Staubach would like to get this one out of his own territory, give himself some room if he can. Staubach has been perfect so far. From 
his own end zone. He's in trouble. Gets it away. Complete to Cosby to the 15 yard line, just short of the first down. Doug Cosby, rookie from Santa Clara, same school that produced Dan Pastorini. If you have any wonder as why Roger Staubach is one of the great big play quarterbacks in the NFL, watch him pick out the open receiver. Doug Cosby, number 84. Cosby just goes down, hooks up in the zone there. Staubach found time to throw that football. We're going to go behind the quarterback, give you a look down on the pits. Roger's under pressure here. He's going to be blindsided from the backside, just steps up, gets away from the rush of Washington. Fires the ball. What a what a beautiful play and what smart football from Stop. Third and one. Newhouse. First down and more. Flag is down. Newhouse all the way to the 41 yard line. And his own version of the straight arm on the way. But it may be called back. We'll see. It's offside or no, that's just a resting no, position. Holding. Holding. You had to wonder how that play opened up so widely to the outside. Somebody just flat got tackled in there, Dick. So a 27-yard run by Newhouse called back. That was not unlike Campbell's run for a touchdown once he got in the open. I wonder if Tom Landry's ever worn a cowboy hat like the <laughs> one that Bum Phillips has on. That looks like the hat you wore, the one that Bum has on with a little rattlesnake band on it. You're going to wear that hat for us at halftime? Your hat? I, I may put it on, you bet. If you're doing a game between Houston and Dallas on Thanksgiving Day, you ought to wear a cowboy hat. Where's your cowboy hat, Dick? Well, I was just wondering, no wonder that my Daniel Boone hat didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Ball is marked back to the 12-yard line to match the number on the quarterback's back. Third down, eight. Pearson to the left, Hill to the right. Both of them have 46 catches this year. Billy Joe Dupre also to the left, and Preston Pearson, a triple left. First time out of the spread, and Staubach going to run it. Not quite to a first down. He had to get across the 15, and the Cowboys almost knew that's where they had to build a wall to stop him. Well, and they knew exactly, the defenders knew exactly where that first down line was. They just built the line across and saved it right down on the pits with Roger Staubach. Watch the pressure coming at him now. Sees the opening right there and quickly reacts to it, runs, hoping for the first down, but he's smart enough to know that when you can't get the first down, don't get hurt. Don't get banged up. Danny White picks it away, drives it deep. Richard Ellender at the 43. He's at the 50, flags are down, and Ellender is finally dragged down by Brinson at the 40-yard line. But it appears Houston and the illegal block to free their return man. And what a shame. The finger was pointed at number 36, Carter Hartwig, and his block was actually away from the play, was not a necessary block. A fine return is going to be nullified by that penalty. There you see the signal from the from the official, an illegal block thrown. Boy, that's really a shame for Houston. They still get the ball, though, in, in excellent field position, but not nearly as good as it would have been. We hope you'll join Merlin, myself. We have different assignments on Sports World this Saturday. An excellent show. We'll be in Los Angeles. Linda Fratiani, Ty Babylonia, Randy Gardner, JoJo Starbucks, some of the outstanding figure skaters in the United States and the world in star skates. Merlin from Leningrad will have the World Invitational Weightlifting Championships along with John Brody. Also the Legends of Bowling with Jay Randolph all next Saturday on Sports World. Chance to see the new emerging Russian super heavyweight Sultan Rachmanov on Saturday deck. He's an exciting performer. Pastorini on first down. Has a man open. Can't hit Renfro at the 46-yard line. Benny Barnes, 31 on the coverage for the Cowboys. That's the kind of pass that literally disappeared from this Houston offense early in the year. Pastorini's arm was bothered so much that he couldn't throw anything that took a, a straight line throw like that uh, sideline pattern. He that has done better recently, though. And is it not for the fans at home to judge a quarterback as to whether he is healthy or whether his uh, age is taking something out of the arm is the long out pass. If you can't throw that, that shortens the field and usually is a demarcation. That out, you, in this case, Pastorini can throw it. Earlier, he could not. That's the first page of the last chapter. Nicely said. Incomplete to Burrow. Randy Hughes in front. 
Aaron Kyle behind on the coverage. Kenny Burrow, double zero from Texas Southern. Pastorini and Burrow have worked well many times over the years, and Pastorini not too happy because he felt that that one could have been caught. The ball thrown very sharply to Burrow, who was coming out of traffic. It was not an easy catch, but one that Burrow normally would make. Burrow has recorded a song, the Super Bowl itch. Line that the Oilers are about ready to scratch and hope they come up with something big, and they're nine and three here on Thanksgiving Day. the middle to the 41 yard line goes Rob Carpenter short of the first down and Dallas is going to get the ball back perhaps not until the second quarter nine seconds left in this first period Cowboys cheer the defense and the end of a very exciting start to this Thanksgiving treat in Irving Texas end of the first quarter it's Dallas 14 Houston 7 we'll be right back after these messages from your local station. Texas Stadium in Irving. Cowboys 14, the Oilers 7, and Dallas control possession of the football almost 2-1 to one in that first quarter. And they're about to get it from Cliff Parsley. Rookies Wilson and Manning are deep at the Dallas 15. Parsley's second punt. Make it his third, and he's kicked well. Hangs this one toward Wilson at the 19, and he's run out of bounds at the 22-yard line. Well, there are many ways to inspire and motivate a team, and Tom Landry, not unlike most coaches, has his means and manners, one of which is the, the old sign system. And there's one of those you'll find in the dressing room of the Dallas Cowboys at their training camp. Not a bad thought uh, for all of us uh, who aren't even in cowboy uniforms, Dick, but Landry is a motivator in many ways. He's a very factual kind of a man, too. Very straight up kind of a man. He'll give you all the numbers and all the facts and figures, and, and he'll point to exactly why you shouldn't be fat. He'll show you the statistics and the whole thing. First down, Dallas at the 22 yard line. Stabak, the door set, trapped. And Bulldog down, and a flag down may have a face mask penalty. I think we do. That's a shame because Robert Brazil had just made an outstanding play from his linebacking position. Let's go back and watch Brazil from start to finish. His job is first to maintain his position. You see it right there. He can't allow the cutback inside and then to pursue and string the play out. But you see the head pull back right there. No question about it. Good call by the official. Brazil did tackle him by the face mask. Robert Brazil, 75 Rookie of the Year defensively. Great speed and strength. Maybe the best athlete on this Houston squad, according to his own teammates. And, and it's they a 15-yard penalty. Flagrant is what they rule on the tackle, and uh, Brazil does not agree with that. Well, the officials have the opportunity, Dick, of either calling the five-yard touching the mask penalty or the 15-yard penalty. In that particular case, they said he literally used the mask or used it flag flagrantly, as you said. So they assessed the stronger of the two penalties. A.O. Phillips along the sidelines. His team has been ticketed for 45 yards in penalties. Dallas, 29. First down at the 35 for the Cowboys. Curly Culp right at the line of scrimmage. He gets a yard. That's pretty good collision between Culp at 265 and Newhouse 215. Both men build along the same line. Not too tall, but mighty wide. Both have that low center of gravity. Curly Culp's been doing that for many years. He did put a real thump on Newhouse. Nick, an interesting thing to reflect on. In this first quarter, the Cowboys scored 14 points. In the last four games, they'd only had seven points in the first quarter. In fact, only seven points in the first three quarters of any of those four games. So they were off to a blazing start considering what they've done the past few weeks. On second and nine, Stavak intercepted. Vernon Perry to the 45 of Dallas. Perry, who was acquired by the Oilers from Montreal of the Canadian League after three years. He's from Jackson State, was picked by the Bears in 76, elected to go to Canada. And Staubach, who has been rarely intercepted this year, that's only his ninth, is 
is picked off, and Houston, trailing by seven, has the ball in Dallas territory, thanks to Vernon Perry. Interception of the season has positioned the Oilers at the Dallas 44. I asked Vernon Perry what the big difference is between Canadian football and American football. He said the speed of the receivers, but his speed made the difference right there. Hill caught flat-footed. Perry stepped in front of him and took that football away from him. You know, that number 32 on his back and those long legs, he looks a little like O.J., doesn't he, the way he moves. Passerini at the 44 of Dallas. Campbell. Close to the 40-yard line. Took four Cowboys to bring him down, led by John Dutton, number 78. Game two, the Cowboys for their number one and their number two draft picks. Next year, they go to Baltimore. He's had a tough time adjusting, not only because of the flex defense, but changing from the right end to the left end, Merlin. Most people would say, well, he's still playing defensive end, but shifting from the right side of the defensive line to the left side is like trying to comb your hand with, or comb your hair with the opposite hand or eat with the opposite hand. Everything you're used to doing is on that side, and it changes the whole thing. Second down, Campbell again. Oh, he's always fighting for that last inch. He'll be short of the first down, third down, and about four. Bob Brunick from Arizona State, number 53, the middle backer for Dallas, made the tackle along with Larry Cole. Campbell's had a big first half, 86 yards already. He conceivably, at the end of today, could be the top rusher in the entire NFL. He leads the AFC by plenty. Larry Cole in on that last tackle. Happy to be back at that defensive tackle spot. He's much more comfortable there than a defensive end. It's closer to third and four. Pastor Inning going to throw. Over the middle, Burrow. That quick slant, and Burrow has it to the 14-yard line. Aaron Kyle made the tackle. Pastor Inning is mad at himself, though. If he had put that ball on the other shoulder of Burrow, and that's not good news, Burrow's still on the ground. Had he put that ball on the inside instead of the outside, Burrow would have had a touchdown. Here's that play again as Burrow on a quick pop over the middle was wide open. Pastorini gets time to throw the football. Ken Burrow just blazing across the middle. And you see it right there. Had to turn back. Made a brilliant catch. Looked like he might have twisted his back a little bit. Time is out on the field. As they work on Burrow, we'll be back to see his condition. It's 14 to 7 Dallas. 12 and a half minutes remaining in the first half. Ken Burrow shaken. He was taking toward his back as he left the field earlier, but off for his own power. He's been the leading receiver for the Oilers six straight years, including this one. First down, Houston at the 14 of Dallas, driving for a possible time touchdown. It's 14 to 7 Dallas. Campbell inside the 10 yard line. And every time you stop Campbell, you almost have to add at least one more yard because he just won't go down on that first contact. Tom Landry talked about Earl Campbell. He said, I have never seen a player willing to do so much, literally willing to do anything they ask of him. He not only runs the football, he blocks it. He'll, he'll line up anywhere you want him to line up. Great compliment from Landry to a very unselfish player. And I think underline the word unselfish. That's the secret to Campbell's success. Second down, a long five. Castorini pumps in trouble. Now throws it away. Boy, there wasn't a blue shirt close to that one. Larry Cole, 63, was hounding Pastorini as we pause now briefly for station identification from Irving, Texas. This is the NBC Television Network. Channel 7, KTVB, Boise. A warm Thanksgiving day to you from Irving, Texas, Texas Stadium. Dick Genberg with Merlin Olson. Second quarter, 11 minutes and 24 seconds remaining before the intermission. The Cowboys lead the Oilers 14 to 7 in this battle of two pro football this year giants in the state of Texas. Sellout crowd at this beautiful stadium. The Cowboys scored the first two times they had the ball. The Oilers scored the first time they had it. And they're driving toward a possible tying touchdown. Third down and six at the 10 yard line. It is Caster. Touchdown. No, he's out of bounds. No score. He did not get both feet down. 
Pastorini, upset by that, felt that the ball could have been caught inside the field goal team coming onto the field. Watch it right here. You'll see Caster coming into your screen, number 88, right there. Watch to see if he does in fact. No, a good call by the official. He had room. I don't think he knew exactly where he was. And that's a good receiver must know where he is on that field. An error by Caster, and it cost him seven points. 16 for 18 is Tony Frisch. 28-yard attempt. And the ex-cowboy hits another. He may be the most consistent, most reliable field goal kicker of this entire NFL. He has three more, 11-16 left in the first half here in Irving, Texas. The Cowboy lead is shaved to four. Ken Burrow still in some pain on the sidelines, a bruised back, but they say he will return to action. It's 14 to 10, Dallas leading Houston. Tony Frisch, after the 27-yard field goal, kicks it away and hits it well. Wilson at the 8, 15, 25, and out to the 28-yard line. Tony Frisch with a field goal and the kickoff, and Tony has really boiled things down rather simply. His role as a National Football League place kicker is simple as one, two, three. As, as kicker, you have three rules to survive. Number one, listen to the whistle. Number two, keep your mouth shut. And number three, keep kicking between the uprights. <laughs> He's a delightful elf from Vienna. He said that Tom Landry and Tex Schramm came over to Vienna to see him as a soccer player, a pro soccer player, and they said, you kick this this ball. He said, this funny ball, you want me to kick that? Are you pulling my leg? <laughs> he does kick that funny ball, and he does a great job of it. Fumble, and recovering appeared to be Staubach himself, as he did not get a clean exchange from his rookie center, Robert Shaw. We'll go back to what we said early in the game. Robert Shaw getting one of his most productive starts. He's going against a noseman, Curly Culp, who will be putting a forearm on his head all day. And one of the things that does is forces you to think about that snap. Now, Roger doesn't want to have to think about that snap. He'd like to have it be automatic. But when you've got somebody beating on you and you haven't had that much experience, you can have problems getting that ball to your quarterback. Staubach has thrown nine times. Not a ball has hit the ground. Eight complete, one intercepted. Dorsett is intercepted by a couple of Oilers at the 30-yard line. Ted Thompson, number 51, in the game made that tackle. Dick, along with the good news that uh, Ken Burrow is not hurt seriously, we did see Mike Barber lift limp off the field earlier. And if his knee is injured again, that certainly would not be good news. You see Burrow there. He's still having trouble with his back and apparently having some pain. We would hope he would be all right. But if those two are down, that really uh, puts the pressure on Pastorini because they are two of his most productive receivers. Third and eight for Dallas at the 30. Spread formation. Stabak complete. Jay Saldi at the 46-yard line. First down, Dallas. Tom Landry didn't lack confidence in that uh, young rookie center. Robert Shaw lets him snap from the spread formation. And Stabak does what he has done so successfully over the past years, picks up the big third down situation, and away they go. Four for five today, Merlin, and passing. Stabak now is nine for ten on the game, and the only one that he's missed has been caught by the Oilers' Vernon Perry. Two touchdowns, one to Pearson, 56 yards, the other a screen to Newhouse, 21 yards. On first down, Stabak, play action. Wide open, Tony Hill. His first catch. First down, Houston 40. We talked about the matchup down in the middle. And certainly one of the reasons that Stavak is having such a great day. He has time to throw. Shaw working on Curly Cope, getting a little help from number 64, Tom Rafferty. And then coming back in, actually three players, 67 Donovan helping. But look at the amount of time he has to throw. And you can't give Roger Staubach that amount of time. He'll do that to you every time. Fine reception by Hill. First and ten. Lots of talk about the great receivers in the game. Stallworth and Swan. Pittsburgh. You've got uh, Joyner and Jefferson at San Diego. Well, these Cowboys, the wide receivers Hill and Pearson, lead the league in yardage. Oops! No one there for
for Staubach, except 59, Ted Washington, the linebacker from Mississippi Valley. Yes, Wonder if that somebody, was a bold play. Well, somebody went the wrong way. Staubach came out, looked out. There was no one coming. Either, either someone blew an audible. See, look at him right there. He's looking for someone to hand to. Newhouse had gone the other direction. And, of course, Washington said, well, come here, Roger. You and I can get together on this thing. No one else to dance with? I'll dance with you. Ted Washington acquired from the New York Jets. He excels against the run. Ken Kennard, number 71, is now in for Houston on second down 15. Draw to Dorsett. Running room, 40, 35. He's near a first down at the 31. Greg Bingham made the tackle. I think Greg Semrick just left part of his attire on the field as Number 33, Tony Dorsett, just faked him right out of it. Watch Dorsett. Good call by Roger. Dorsett making that quick move. Excellent acceleration. Runs away from Bingham. Watch the move right there. He just blew it right past Demerick and gets up the field for the first down. Bingham did catch up to him, but not until he'd almost gotten up for that critical first down. Going to be third and less than a yard to go, Dick. And this is where Staubach has been outstanding. Third down conversions, 4-5. Dorsett, 30, 20, and a first down at the 17. We said earlier that Tony Dorsett would not run over you, but he certainly can run away from you. That was a crossbuck action. Interesting shot. Looked like he was taking it into the line there. Hands off. Gets a nice, gets nice blocking from his offensive line. A big hole, and then makes the most of it down the field. Let's see if Roger can get it into the into the end zone. Put another seven points on the board. You saw number 35, Scott Laidlaw, sent in by Landry. He joins Dorsett. <laughs> Laidlaw gets the ball, and the Oilers stop him for a loss. A possibly one, Elvin Bethay, number 65, the Big E in his 12th year out of North Carolina and I made the tackle, Ted Washington on the assist. Call it no gain, second and a long 10 now as Newhouse comes in, Laidlaw goes out, Hill is back in, and 84, Cosby goes out. Dallas leading 14 to 10. Deep in the Oiler territory, just out the, outside the 16. Both wide receivers to the left, Hill and Pearson. Play action, Newhouse. All the way down to the one yard line goes Robert Newhouse. Well, that's the Dallas offense at its best, Merlin. They had white shirts going all over the field, and Staubach looking away all the time, and then finally flipped it to Newhouse. Well, one of the things you hate to see is someone break that open against you on defense. It's an isolation of a running back against the linebacker, 44 against 54, and that's the result right there. And tragically, we also have a couple of Houston players on the ground over there. Certainly one thing that neither team wants this late in the year, or ever wants, really, is injuries. Number 37, their great safety, Mike Reinfeld. And as you said, Dick, he has been the mainstay of that defense all year, that defensive backfield. They do not want to lose him. He has a distinction of being the only player that will ever go from his university to the NFL, the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, because they don't have a football program anymore. 6'2 and 195 and 12 interceptions this year. One thing we could say about working against the Dallas Cowboys on a short week, it is not easy. They run so many different formations at you, and their defense, the flex defense, is unique. You hate to have to have just a two-day week, really, which is what the Oilers had to get ready for them. It does put the Oilers, I think, at a disadvantage. Remember, we asked Bum about that yesterday. He says, I don't mind the short week as long as I don't have a long day. Well, Roger would like to give him a long day, as with the rest of these Cowboys. If they can score right here, they can put part of that long day together. At the one-yard line. Newhouse doesn't quite get in. And the Oilers acting as though the ball was loose. Andy Doris, Robert Brazil, and others get on the tackle of Newhouse. 
I think Vern Holland just had a hold of Newhouse's head. <laughs> Thought it was the football. <laughs> That's an unfortunate <laughs> error. <laughs> well, I'm sure Newhouse didn't like it. Some very good tackling down on the goal line. Newhouse has that great low center of gravity and powerful running thighs. He is a tough man to tackle at short yardage. Raphael Septien waiting for either a point after or a field goal. On second and goal, Dorset touchdown. of touchdowns scored. Well, they Berlin told you one touchdown in the last four games in the first three quarters. A total of one touchdown. They've scored three times in the first half today. Let's look quickly at that run by Dorsett. Coming to the outside, Herb Scott, number 68, the blocker ahead of him, gets a piece of Vernon Holland or Vernon Perry right there. And although the ball is tucked up against that goal line, that's all it has to do is break the plane. And you can see it right there. Six points, Septian going for seven. He's got it. Five minutes and 15 seconds remaining in the first half. The Cowboys now enjoy their biggest lead. Dallas 21, Houston 10. He's to the 10, has a little opening. And no, oh, that's Ellender out to the 23 yard line. Richard Ellender to the 23. Raphael Septien, who is about to be married. There's his fiance. And here's the ring. Now she hasn't seen it. He said, I'll show you the ring I'm going to give her, but I, I don't want her to see it. And since she's here in the stadium today, he said, I'll, I'll let you folks at home appreciate it. He's going to be married on Saturday. Because the Cowboys will have a well-earned 10-day rest after this one. 21 to 10, Cowboys. Pastorini to Campbell. Hit in the backfield. John Dutton. A departure, Dick, from normal data, Dallas strategy. They've built their team through the draft, but they went into the trade market to get big John Dutton. And if he can make plays for them like that play, he certainly will help to fill some vacant shoes, those of two tall Jones on the left side of that defensive line. Pastorini is three for eight, passing only 28 yards. Second and 12. Play action. Got a man open. Caster, 45. Out of bounds near midfield. The tall target, Richard Caster, the former Jet from Jackson State, has a first down for the Oilers at the 49. Let's give a little credit to Leon Gray, number 74, who kept Harvey Martin away from Pastorini. Watch it on the left side. He's going to push Harvey Martin right there beyond Pastorini. Give him time to throw that football. Caster in the open, as you said, gets the ball, pulls it down, makes a big first down. Oilers have it moving, have a little bit of time here. Let's see if they can get some points on the board. Four minutes, 19 seconds left, first half. Campbell. Mike Hegman gets him, and he's finished off by Aaron Kyle. But it was Hegman from Tennessee State, number 58, who latched onto him initially. Ironically, Hegman replacing Thomas Henderson and it was Henderson and Hegman who collaborated on that unusual play in the Super Bowl where Henderson stripped the ball from Terry Bradshaw Hegman went 25 yards for a Dallas touchdown and now it's Hegman for the man who's now departed the ranks of the Cowboys Hollywood Henderson is gone Bruce Thornton and Dave Stalls have gone into that defensive lineup give them a little more pass rushing pressure as they anticipate the throw from Dan Pastorini. Trap and it's Wilson up the middle and the big guy from Maryland is inside the 45 before stalls from northern Colorado and Randy Hughes the safety from Oklahoma can make the tackle Wilson carries the ball rarely has 237 yards rushing this year he's from Maryland he was a college blocking back and basically that's his role with the Oilers Earl Campbell is coming off the field uh, as they replace both the backs both of the offensive backs. 
Richard Castor came off too. He doesn't know what the play is, so he lines up wide left. Pastorini a audible in this situation. Make sure they know it. Third and four. Mike Renfro, a first down. Renfro, and a famous NFL name, his dad, Ray Renfro, outstanding wide receiver with the Cleveland Browns. And his dad was a former assistant coach here in Dallas. So Mike was a Cowboy fan and a Browns fan. And uh, they asked him who was his favorite. He said, oh, no doubt about that. The man. I love to watch the man. And that was Jim Brown with the Cleveland Browns. First down for the Oilers at the 38-yard line. Renfro left, tight formation. Wilson in motion and Campbell sweeping left. Oh, what running by Campbell to the 30-yard line. The big guy is quite a dancer. It's almost unfair to give a man that size, that kind of agility and balance. Let's go down and give you the feeling of what it must look like to have Campbell running at you. Watch the cuts here, breaks inside, Gets away from a possible tackle by Hegman. Right over the top of number 25, Aaron Kyle. And a shoestringer there, or he'd have had to have been ridden down from behind and would have gotten even bigger yardage. Second and two, Campbell has 95 yards rushing this first half. Wilson, this time on a trap, picks up the first down at the Dallas 27. John Dutton made the tackle for Dallas. That brings us up close to the two-minute warning. And Houston, interestingly, going to call a timeout here before that two-minute warning. Well, they probably want to decide what do they want to do in this situation. This is kind of a throwaway down, Dick. I'm sure Pastorini over to talk to Bump Phillips and to the offensive coordinators of that Houston offense. Merlin looking ahead to Sunday. After you come back from uh, Leningrad and I get back from Los Angeles. <laughs> That'd be a quick trip. Sports World on Saturday. On Sunday, we're going to be out in Denver in the snow, but we've got a great lineup, a doubleheader for you on NBC beginning at 12.30 with NFL 79. Cleveland and Pittsburgh, and I know some of the Browns and Steelers watching this one, they'll go at it on Sunday. Of course, Cleveland just a game behind the Steelers and the Oilers. Buffalo and New England, Chuck Knox trying to get above 500. New England trying to stay atop the AFC East. And then at 4 o'clock, we'll be at Denver. The Raiders beat the Broncos earlier this year out on the West Coast. Kansas City at San Diego trying to spoil the Chargers fun. And Miami trying to rebound at Baltimore. You talk, Dick, about emotion. At uh, Cleveland and Pittsburgh game, those teams, they don't dislike each other. They hate each other. And, of course, after the tremendous surprise to, to Pittsburgh fans and what happened to them this last week, they've got to be trying to get back into the ball game. And I would hate to have been in their practice with Chuck Noel during this week of practice. Indeed. That should be the game of the week. Earl Campbell, big hole. And he's gone to the races again. Oh, and I like that touch. Just lay the ball down. Almost as simple as the run. And a man had a shot at him, and he ran through that tackle as if it was made of feathers. Landry himself said it. He said, that man is awesome. He's unbelievable. He can do it all. And he just did part of it here. Again, giving you the chance to feel what it must be like for those defensive backs to see 235 pounds hurtling at them. And Earl just makes it look easy on into the end zone. There it is. This is, is that what you do when you get a touchdown? Just set it down <laughs> like an Easter egg. I like that with all the flair of the touchdown spike. That's a nice contrast. Frisch tacks on the extra point, and we've got a ball game that is squeezed into a four point lead for Dallas with two minutes exactly remaining in the first half. It's now the Cowboys 21, and Earl Campbell and the Oilers have 17. Now the Oilers, Earl Campbell has his second touchdown as the Houston club goes 77 yards in eight plays. Campbell already over the 100-yard mark in the first half. He has 122 yards. And great for all of us here at NBC to be at Texas Stadium, Texas Rams sports edifice here in Irving, Texas. And we wish you all a very happy holiday. Hope along with the things that are happening around the world while you celebrate this day with your family that you think about how fortunate we are to be in this great country. 
And this tradition part of Thanksgiving, of course, the play of the big football game, usually between the two local high school rivals, and now including, of course, the NFL clubs. Ron Springs at the seven. 20. And he's out to the 33-yard line, a crack in the Houston door, and Springs shot through it. At halftime, NFL 79. Mike Adam Lee with us here in Irving, Texas. Brian Gumbel. Boy, he was running around today between the parade and back in the studios in New York. Brian, Earl Campbell are the leading rushers in the nation today. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's how he stays so thin. Well, at the 34, wouldn't you know it? That's Earl Campbell's number. It's kind of, we've seen a lot of that today. Dallas has a minute 55 to add to the 21-17 lead out of the spread. Preston Pearson is in at one of the wings. Sabat hits Pearson, and he wiggles three and gets a couple of more out to the 44 before Greg Bingham from Purdue can make the tackle. Bingham, number 54, said he almost went to Notre Dame, was recruited by the Irish as a tight end, but then Notre Dame had a chance to get a guy named Dave Casper. So Bingham said, I found myself going to Purdue. He's a fine linebacker, has led this team in tackles for six years and is leading him again this year. Staubach again out of the spread, dumps it off to Dorset at the 40, a beautiful move at the 50. He's at the 40, still on his feet to the 39. First down, Dallas will use a timeout, their first with a minute 15 left. Dick, I think uh, since John Unitas left the game that my vote for the man who uses that clock as well as anyone in football has to go to Staubach. And he does it again here. Just dropping the football off from the spread formation to Tony Dorsett. He's got, he's got defenders spread all over the field, gets it into the hands of the explosive Dorsett, and look at him. Goes past Ted Thompson, 51 right there, works around, actually doubled across, almost got away that time until they finally got him on the ground. But he's got great field position, an opportunity here maybe to get another three or even seven points on the board. His own man stopped him. I wonder if we have time to go back and see the start of that again, that first fake by Dorsett. I mean, he seemed to have full speed that was going to go to his right to the outside, and then that quick stop and, and, and almost in the same motion. He's so quick, you don't realize the kind of move he put on the defense. Yeah, Mike Weissman and uh, Ted Nathanson have it for us again. Let's watch the first fake by Dorsett. Watch Tony now. Again, Dick, just gets it in the open here. You'd like to have your best runner with the football in that much room. But right here, he's just going to put a little move right. Oh, you got it already. But there again, He's going to come back. Look how far he cuts. That's almost more than a 90-degree turn right there. And if his blocker had kept going, he might have gotten more yardage out of it. Excellent slow motion. You don't quite appreciate how quick that first move was, but it is a first down at the 39. Again out of the spread. A minute 15 seconds remaining. First half, Dallas leads by four. Pearson wrapped up by Curly Culp. Culp stayed at home. There's the sagacity of a veteran defensive tackle. Didn't wander away and was in the right spot in the middle of that screen. I think a little good fortune. He got knocked down, got up, and found himself looking at Pearson, who had the football, tackled him. Well, that's big wise. And <laughs> wise not to be knocked out. Certainly in the right place at the right time. Oh, first down. Oh, Johnny Hill juggling the ball incomplete. Fans are booing on the far side, but you saw it clearly. Hill did not have control. Stops the clock with 46 seconds left in the half. Roger Stavak, certainly amazing in the way he can throw that football so accurately. I'll tell you, Dick, Roger Stavak did lengthen or shorten, I think in fact shorten a few of my seasons over the years with that kind of throw. He'd like to put a few more points on the board before they go in at halftime. Give the Cowboys an even wider edge than they have over the Oilers. Roger uh, owning an obvious advantage. Passing in this first half. Third down, 14. He's five for six. Third down conversions. Good protection. Saldi incomplete. Nice play by Vernon Perry, who is hawking the tight end across the middle of the field. And 69, Andy Doris was pressuring Roger Staubach. And that's a big play. Right there, they're trying to get the first down, trying to maintain and sustain the drive. Still had 41 seconds on the clock. The pass is on the money, and Saldi would have caught it. But watch the stripping action right there. Perry takes the arm, pulls it away, 
You can't catch that ball one-handed. Danny White, the punter, but also an excellent runner and passer, and the Oilers are not going to take any chances, and he does kick it. They let it bounce at the five, and it's down by Aaron Mitchell, the rookie cornerback from Nevada, Las Vegas, at the two-yard line. 30 seconds left. I don't think we'll see any wild antics from Houston. Uh, probably content to go in with with the score 21-17 and starting the drive on their own four-yard line. And they mark it at the four. Roger Staubach, Dan Pastorini. Pastorini, a comment by Mike Barber is tight end in just that. He said, you fellas always talking about Craig Morton being uh, one of the slowest quarterbacks, the le least mobile. He said, Pastorini is so slow when he was a kid, his mother made dinner at 6 and called Dan at 5.30 to make sure he got there. <laughs> That's unkind. Guido Merkins in motion, playing the wide receiver, and it's Campbell protecting the football out to the five-yard line. I'm going to give you a quiz, Merlin. Who is the only NFL quarterback, listed quarterback, to catch a touchdown pass in the NFL this year? We'll let you think about that. We'll give you a hint. He caught it against the Pittsburgh Steelers, a quarterback who has caught a I, touchdown pass. I know the answer. I'm going to let you. I'll let our fans at home think about it for a second. Final seconds. And the end of an outstanding, entertaining first half. Dallas leading 21-17. The answer is Guido Merkins. That's right. <laughs> Number 12, Guido Merkins, listed as the third string quarterback. There he is. He's also first into the locker room. He caught a touchdown. His only catch of the year. Coleman takes it at the 2. The veteran at the 15. And out to the 27-yard line, almost lost the football as Aaron Mitchell, number 34, made the tackle for Dallas. The first half statistics, very impressive. We saw a lot of offense, Merlin. I think the most impressive thing may be the fact that we've seen 472 yards of offense collectively. It has been an offensive explosion. And look at the numbers on the Dallas side. 14 for 17 passing for Staubach. And, of course, the big number on the Oilers side, 200 yards rushing. Boy, that's a, those are big numbers. Let's see if they can sustain. If they can, this is going to be a great offensive side of the game. Great offensive game, both sides. Campbell, who had 122 yards rushing and two long touchdowns in the first half, gets the first call to open the second half, and he's out to about the 33-yard line, where it'll be second down and six. Larry Cole made the tackle. Earl Campbell in only his second season, and I'm sure for many of the tacklers around the NFL, it feels as if he's been here for a career. I liked uh, Pete Wysocki, the linebacker with the Redskins, comment, tackling Earl Campbell sure does reduce your IQ. He'll pound on you. Double wing, Campbell the only man behind Pastorini, and he gets the ball and has the speed but cannot run Kyle, who finally drags him down close to a first down at the 39. As impressive as Campbell is, he can't succeed without great blocking. We'd like to take you down into the pits and watch Leon Gray, number 74, who just blasted Harvey Martin, number 79, almost put him on his back on that last play. Look at it right here. Number 79, Harvey Martin, but that's number 74, Leon Gray, taking an all-pro back and almost parking him in his own defensive backfield. That's some fine offensive thrust from the offensive line. And did you see Campbell? Kyle hit him six yards before Campbell went down. First down at the 40. Campbell again. He's got five. He's got eight more yards. Earl Campbell celebrating his own Thanksgiving as he's devouring that Dallas defense. Let's go down on field level. Again, we'll show you the awesome power and quickness right there. The ability to cut behind those blocks, take the smallest gap. Not much room there, but enough for Earl Campbell. Gets it all the way down to the 48-yard line, second and two. Renfro and Merkins are the wide receivers on the wings. Merkins in motion. On second and two, Campbell, first down, and look at him. Burrow underneath the pile to the 47 of Dallas. Oh, we had a little correction on our quiz. Guido Merkins is not the only listed quarterback who has caught a touchdown pass. We'll give you that information in a moment as Harvey Martin. Harvey Martin being driven down the field there. That's actually 76, Larry Bethay, too, as Martin shot quickly up the field, opened a little bit of a space. Bethay driven off the ball, and Earl Campbell submarine that time. It looked like he just dove about two inches off the ground, 
made the first down yardage. It'll be first and ten. Something happened over here. What, the, what are they doing, Dick? I think they need a, another football or the chain gang. They're motion for someone to get out of the way. Well, anyway, to update, Guido Merkins, who is listed as the third string quarterback for the Oilers, has caught a touchdown pass, but he's not the only one. Our friend Bob Carney has called from Miami. Bob Carney wanted to correct you, Dick. Actually, Hardy, who plays tight end for them, has also the number four quarterback, has three touchdowns on the year, and has a couple of snaps at quarterback. So Bruce Hardy is ahead of Guido Merkins in the quarterback touchdown department. Right. Well, thanks to Bob for calling in. Bruce Hardy. Merkins in motion on first down. A pump fake to Merkins. Pass to Rini wide open. Renfro at the 20. He got a block from the official and goes in for a touchdown. Renfro used the official as a screen and scores. A double fake. And then the throw to Renfro left alone. Pass to Rainey to Renfro. Well, we just got through talking about the great passing of Roger Stomach. Pass to Rainey going to do some of his own right here. There's Renfro's father. Now well, Renfro, great all pro. He must be standing and applauding the efforts of his son right there. And of course, Mike Barber also happy on that sideline. Bum Phillips. What a great play. That long pump fake. Throws that defensive secondary, gave him time to get that ball into an open Mike Barber, and he did the rest of it. Not Mike Barber, Renfro. Mike Renfro, Dad Ray Renfro looking on. Oh, he missed the extra point. The usually reliable Tony Frisch hits the upright, and that could change the complexion of the game. Let's see the touchdown again as Pastorini Round Mike Renfro wide open over the middle after the double fake. Watch the fake of the screen right there, the long pump action. And that's just enough to give Renfro a chance to break into the open. He does a great job. Watch the official now on the side of the screen, left side of the screen. Renfro cuts back behind, gets a chance then to get into the end zone. Renfro again as we isolate on him. Downfield, he gets Harris retreating. Harris lost the receiver, simply lost him. He's going to be way off to the side. Renfro breaking in beside the official. Waltz is into the end zone all by himself. Mike Renfro, his first touchdown catch of the year. Pastorini had time to throw that. And again, it was the fake of what appeared to be a screen that set that play up. Beautiful play acting. But even the first fake to Campbell, the fact that Campbell, everyone is so cognizant of him, he faked to Campbell on the run, that did one job of freezing. Then the fake to Perkins in the flat did another job, and then Renfro free over the middle. Well, I think Cliff Harris focused on that, what he thought was a screen out there, simply lost his man, had to drift back, and that set the play up for the Houston Oilers. Steve Wilson returns the kick out to the 28-yard line, and Dallas trailing. 23-21 has the football for the first time in the second half, and we'll see just how important that missed extra point by Frisch happens to be. You see the feeling right there from Tony Fritch. He's still upset. He doesn't miss many kicks, and he has the confidence of his teammates, but, well, if they can continue to play the way they have offensively, that kick may not be important. Roger Staubach with a sensational first half. Well, the Cowboys have had their problems. You can't say that about Staubach. This is his best year in the eyes of many Dallas observers. He hits Pearson first down at the 41-yard line. Oh, out of bounds, he said. Oh, inbounds. Just he waved the time out as Pearson left the field to play. Curly Culp on top of Staubach uh, as he threw that football, actually delivered a blow to the top of Staubach's helmet. Lucky he didn't get called for a penalty. The Oilers needed only five plays to go the 71 yards and take the lead 23-21. Well, Dallas opened the first half with a big touchdown, and Houston answered. Uh, Houston's opened the second half with a big touchdown. Let's see if Dallas can answer. First down at the 41 for the Cowboys. Saldy, the tight end in motion. It's Newhouse sweeping left. And gains about three to the 44-yard line. Greg Bingham, 54, made the tackle. One of the officials knocked down the linesman on the near side. Newhouse, those huge thighs. He's built a lot like Earl Campbell. Robert, 5'10", 
five ten and two fifteen. He buys thirty six inch waist pants. Because and his waist is only thirty one but he needs the thirty six pants and then he alters them so he can get his thighs through those leg spaces. This officiating business is getting kind of tough. Tony Kramer one of the officials uh, normally with this crew is watching this game today as he was injured last week. One of the officials on the sideline apparently banged up a little bit. Uh, Bill Ross the head linesman guy. giving him a drink of water down there and patting him on the back. You OK. All right. Go back in the ball game. <laughs> a quick look at the officials. Not so easy to try and stay out of the way not to get caught. Staubach looking to the sideline getting a few words of instruction there from Tom Landry the offensive staff key to the officials is Merlin they're in a position where they can't always watch all the players they're watching areas and don't always see men coming in on their blind side specific responsibilities Dick and they they do it well I have to commend them they've done a good job of this game so far today second down seven out of the eye fake to Dorsett Sabak driven down at the 37 yard line it was whistled dead earlier but an oiler is injured on the play the second sack of Staubach and he acts as though he's OK. Let's check the condition of Andy Doris number 69. Andy Doris still on the ground I think he'll be all right may just have had the wind knock out of him but you saw Staubach take advantage of the oiler blitz earlier in the game with a touchdown on that particular play the blitz came again Staubach did not have an open receiver watch it here 51 Ted Thompson and 54 Bingham coming right here that's Thompson 51 breaking clean Doris actually got hit by Elvin Bethay uh, number 65 looked like Bethay and wrapping around Staubach caught Doris in the stomach with his hand time out well the attend of the injured Andy Doris we have 10 minutes and 46 seconds left in the third quarter and Houston 23 Dallas 21 10 minutes Beginning in the third quarter, Cowboys on third and 15 from their own 36. Out of the spread. They overload the right side. Now they balance it off. Stavok so good on third down, he's got some running room. It's incomplete to Preston Pearson. And Stavok was not beyond the line of scrimmage, but very close to it. Greg Bingham on the coverage. Today's attendance, 65,068 tickets sold. Nearly 64,000 are here. 1,171 stayed home and had their dinner and watched us on NBC. Greg Bingham, number 54, absolutely doing a great job tracking Stavak to the sideline. Stavak knew he wasn't get a, getting, going to get away. Tried to get it to his favorite receiver in that situation. Preston Pearson, all to no avail. Danny White going to kick it away. Had to punt only twice in the first half. Merkins is deep for Houston at the 25. High end of Rand Merkins, fair catch at the 35 of Houston. So the Oilers get good field position. White looked as if he had thoughts about possibly doing something other than punting. Timeout, 10 minutes, 10 seconds left in the third quarter here in Irving, Texas, where the Oilers from the south lead the hometown Cowboys by two. Oilers ball with a lead 23 21 middle of the third quarter here in Irving Texas Earl Campbell plowing out another five to the 40 yard line. Campbell who has acquired the rights who has acquired from Tampa Bay for tight end Jimmy Giles and three draft picks. Cliff Harris made that last stop. What a day for Campbell already and they're still Almost 10 minutes left in the third quarter. One of the other teams that talked to Tampa Bay about those rights was the Dallas Cowboys. Can you imagine Campbell and Dorsett in the same backfield? Mm, that's frightening. Campbell again. No game. They were waiting for him that time. Larry Cole, 63, and Mike Eggman, 58, collaborated on the stop. Campbell with two touchdowns today, Merlin, is now just one away from the Houston record set by Billy Groman back in 1961 18 for Groman and he's just two away from the NFL record for rushing touchdowns Jimmy Taylor had 19 back in 62 so Campbell is on a record course Earl coming out of the game they sent Rob Carpenter in past reading probably to pass as he spreads everyone got his receivers all over the field 
third and five from the 40. Good protection. Complete to Barber. He fumbles. Was he down? Yes. Cowboys have the ball, but that scramble to no avail. First down at the 50. Barber was down. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network. The news source, KTVB, Channel 7, Boise. Dick Hanberg with Merlin Olson, Rob Carpenter, 26, not Barber, 86, made that reception out of the backfield. It gives Houston a first down. Ball dissected by the 50-yard line. Tom Landry's Cowboys have lost three of four, and they admit they should be four straight defeats. They pulled one out against the Giants, and they trail Houston today, 23-21. Campbell. Cutting back inside, carrying tacklers to the 44 for six yards. When Dallas has been able to stop Campbell, they usually have forced him to turn toward the sideline, which really takes his momentum away from him. And they've made some good stops on him when they've done that. He turned back up the field on that one and just literally bulldozed two or three of the Cowboys, made an extra three or four yards before he finally hit the turf. A.O. Bum Phillips got that nickname from a younger sister who couldn't say brother. It came out Bumble, and short for Bumble was Bum. Second down four. Campbell again. Did he fumble or did he just slip away? He slipped away to the 40 and close to a first down. He looked as if he was stopped. He just simply hit the pile, kept his balance. Made another stab at it, and it looks like he picked up the first down, Dick. They run a formation with Campbell being the long back. Called, they would call it an ace formation. Put two wings up on the outside. A lot of teams wouldn't be able to run out of that formation. They need the blocking of a back. But number 34, Earl Campbell, can run from it. He makes big gains from it, and it forces some spreading of the defense. Now there's his belt buckle, 34. Looks like a heavyweight championship belt. And they figure that when he has that ball, he's a champ. First down at the Dallas 40. Again, double wing, give to Campbell. He gets about four yards. It'll be second and six. Larry Cole spearheaded the defensive charge. You know the nice thing, you hear good things about players, and I like Bum Phillips' comment, Merlin, last year after Campbell is a rookie of the year and the NFL rushing champion won 30 pro awards. But Bum said, what I remember most was Earl's team play. Well, I think I said earlier, and I, I would like to say it again, I think the special thing to underline in describing Earl Campbell is that he is unselfish. And that is difficult for a superstar to do when he is getting, a, when he is getting as much acclaim as Campbell has been getting. Some have not carried it quite so well. Second and six at the 36. Campbell. And they finally are able to wrestle him down at the 33, where it'll be third down and three. And in fact, part of the now departed Thomas Henderson's problems were that he did not handle his notoriety quite as well as this man, Earl Campbell, who gets up slowly. But we've seen him do that before. That's going to take an innate count before he goes back and starts jabbing again. Well, he's had a lot of work today. He did come into this game relatively rested. He only played a half last week against Cincinnati. Dallas would have liked to see him go the whole game against Cincinnati. He only carried uh, about, what, 18, 19 times in the game for over 100 yards. Though. They're in four down territory. This time it's Tim Wilson, the only back behind pass for any. And Wilson does not get the first down. He gets a yard. It'll be fourth and two. So Houston taking Campbell out and perhaps Mum Phillips hoping to give the Cowboys a look that they throw the ball. Did not. And the Cowboys were ready. Cole, Brunig, Harris all in on the stop. Bum Phillips uh, making his decision on the sideline. Apparently Gonna to go for, go for it. Well, when you've got a tool like Earl Campbell, and he is a short yardage tool, on third and one to three, he's averaged over five yards a carry. That is one of the most unbelievable stats I have ever seen in short yardage carry. This is a momentum play. If Dallas stops Houston, they can get some force of their own. Fourth and two. Campbell fumbles. Ooh. Dallas will take over on downs. You saw the official motion. Houston recovered. It doesn't matter. Dallas gets the ball on downs. Strange, Dick, how football games can turn on little things. 
except for two feet not coming down in the first half for Caster, the game would have been tried tied 21-21. Now it's uh, uh, Earl Campbell not quite getting a hold of the football as he started into the line. Didn't have any chance to go for the first down. As Campbell comes off, we're going to take a break. Four minutes and 46 seconds remaining in the third quarter. The Dallas Cowboys will have the football when we come back. Campbell, a little trouble with a handoff, does not get the first down. And Dallas will start from their own 34. Oilers 23, Dallas 21. Hi, I'm Dan Pastorini. There's a full schedule of football on NBC this weekend, and I'm particularly interested in the Pittsburgh-Cleveland game. Please be watching. Thank you, Dan. That, of course, will be at 1230 NFL 79 this Sunday. The Browns and Steelers at Three Rivers. Merlin and I will be at Denver. It's the Broncos seek revenge against the Oakland Raiders. Cowboys 23-21. They trail the Oilers as Staubach takes over on his own 34. Gerson in motion to the inside and Staubach going to throw. Secondary target is Billy Joe Dupre. He's at the 50 and all the way to the Oiler 47. They still can't get Dupre down. I like to talk about Billy Joe. He's a, not only an outstanding athlete from Michigan State, but he's a gentleman and he's a humanitarian and in fact is one of the five finalists for the YMCA Brian Piccolo Humanitarian Award. And that is, indicates uh, the kind of man he is. He goes off uh, as you look at his shoes and he has plenty of those in his locker. You'll see in just a moment. <laughs> that is just the supply of one man, Billy Joe Dupre shoes. There is his street shoes on the outside, the alligators. A reverse to Pearson. 50, 45, 40. It gains six yards. I'd like to mention the other men who are finalists along with Dupre for that honor. David Winfield of the San Diego Padres, Archie Manning, the quarterback of the Saints, Austin Carr of the Cavaliers, and Greg Lazinski of the Phils, along with Dupre, are the finalists for that Piccolo Award. And on this day of Thanksgiving, where we take time to think about our families and people we care about and helping others, nice to note that the football athlete is involved in projects away from the field that are meaningful as well. Second and four at the 41 of Houston. Dorsett inside then outside almost fumbled at the 39 the fumble occurred after the ball and while we're on that topic of contributing to the others he'd never say it, but Merlin Olson involved in the multiple sclerosis drives and key member of efforts in Los Angeles he flew without sleep the other night to get here to Dallas after a big MS dinner of the Seattle Seahawks up in the Seattle area and uh, I commend you for the time you spend away and I know that you've met a lot of good friends who also are are contributing to that cause. Thank you Dick. Uh, I, I think one of the nice thing about athletes uh, one of the nice things that we see in other cities too they are willing to give something back. Uh, we do get so much from this great game and I I'm glad to see athletes all over the country welcome uh, welcoming an opportunity to give something back. Third down and two and Dorsett has a first down and more as he spins down to the Houston 27. Well, the Cowboys trailing for the first time in the game, marching deep into Oiler territory, a first down at the 27. One of the things that uh, the Cowboys have been concerned about, they feel that Dorsett has been too quick to take that outside move. You saw it uh, on the play earlier when he broke to the outside. There apparently was a hole inside. Dorsett stopped for almost no gain. But you can see why he likes to do it here. I believe that play was designed to go outside. Dorsett just taking the quick dip using his great speed to get out there. 33 J.C. Wilson, 32 Vernon Perry actually finally brought him down. Boy, Niehaus a terrific block right on the corner to help Dorsett and Newhouse unable to gain his footing. He may have to go into Billy Joe's locker and get him <laughs> some more suction. One of the things that happens on this turf, Dick, uh, when it, once it gets wet, the sun doesn't get in here and this turf will stay wet uh, for the rest of the year until the heat of summer. And this field has been wet a couple of times this year. As it gets cooler, the moisture comes to the surface. It does tend to get a little bit slippery. Of course, uh, the fans are protected by the roof, but the opening larger than the size of the field itself allows the elements to figure. Second down, 13. 
Staubach with a hot hand under a blitz. Good call to Dorsett, but he goes down. He was not down by the impetus of a tackler, and now he is. Actually went down without being touched by an oiler. That was a play that had possible touchdown written on it because Staubach with the Oilers on a blitz had nothing but blockers and Dorsett upfield and one Oiler. Just a great play and a great call. Staubach doing a good job of play acting. Sucked everybody in. They put great pressure on him but they opened up for the middle screen and had it not been. Watch Culp. Get an idea. Culp is he's sold. He believes that this is a pass. Breaking clean. Look at it. A blitz. Again a perfect time to have that play called. Culp forced the ball a little high, and it was number 52, Robert Brazil, that made the big stopping play in there. Cowboys in a spread. Third down and 19 from the 36. Salty has the catch at the 27, but that just gets the Cowboys back to the original line of scrimmage on this sequence of play. So it's fourth down and 10. Dallas unable to convert on that third down, so they're 6 of 10 for the day, and that is the end of the third quarter. Now the drama begins to build here at Texas Stadium. 15 minutes to go between these two teams battling to stay in first place in their respective divisions. Houston, 23. Dallas, 21. Well, indeed, no place like home. From Texas Stadium, Dick Enberg with Merlin Olsen. Would open the fourth quarter on a play that may decide the lead. The Oilers, 23, Dallas, 21. But Rafael Septien, who has connected only once in that 40 to 49-yard range, although he has kicked two outside 50, will try a 44-yard attempt out of Danny White's hold. This for the lead. Long enough. Good. Dallas 24, Houston 23. Well, the pressure's on the place kicker. Uh, Rafael Septien not only has practiced hard physically, but there's a whole emotional training that a man must go through to be an outstanding kicker. What goes through my mind when you go over there and kick uh, the last second field goal in order to win or lose the game, it goes to my mind is that it's a very a lot of pressure situation, but the way I handle it is thinking about in a positive way by thinking that we're hit 35-0, and I should be able to just go and relax and smile and enjoy the winning. Yeah, he's smiling after that one, 24-23. I remember as a rookie with the Rams, Merlin Olson, when you were playing, did an interview with him two games before the end of the year, and he says, "Boy, I sure thought those St. Louis Redskins were tough." <laughs> Sometimes you don't want to know too much. <laughs> he has made some adjustments to the game since then. And of course that extra point missed by his counterpart Tony Fritch has become a very important factor. In the one, one point lead for the Dallas Cowboys. Just seconds into the final quarter Septien's kick takes a lateral bound and out of bounds for the procedure penalty and Raphael will have to kick it from his 30 yard line. Tony Frisch who doesn't miss many has a reputation of being the most consistent kicker has a field goal today but a missed extra point is a difference in the game at the moment Frisch who has won three games this year in the final seconds two of them in overtime for the Oilers with that missed extra point not likely we'd have an extra 15 minutes today not unless we could change the Canadian rules <laughs> we might get a rouge yeah, yeah we could get a rouge <laughs> Ron Coleman and Carter Hartwig are joined by Tim Wilson at the moment deep downfield and they may be putting on a play Wilson coming back to talk to his two deep return men. We saw that ball hang right on the sideline Dick. That's the same thing that happened to Hartwig earlier in the game and you remember he stood there debating finally took the ball and accidentally stepped out of bounds on that play. He should have let it go out of bounds as they did on this one. Take the five yard penalty against the kicker possibly set up a deep return give them a chance to get good field position on the return. Septien, who tended southwest Louisiana. Short High kick. but short. And that one's going to go out of bounds at the 20 yard line. So the Cowboys now will kick from the 25 yard line, and Septien disgusted with himself. Well, Septien uh, not going to draw any raves from the coaching staff on the other sideline. They're going to march it back another five. Uh, not to alibi for him, but it did appear that he was trying to kick 
left and then kick right, not kick the ball down the middle. That by intent, he is trying to kick toward the sidelines, not quite that far, however. I'm sure the Dallas Cowboys have a directional coverage on. In other words, uh, wanting to know which side the ball will be kicked to and asking Septien to kick specifically to one side or the other. On that particular play, he, he hung the ball high. Had a receiver been able to get there and take a hold of it, he would have received the ball on about the 30-yard line. Possibility then for a big return. You know, Raphael's father was a captain of the Mexico soccer team, the Mexican football team, in two different World Cups. So he comes from a very talented heritage. He was recruited to Southwest Louisiana on the recommendation of a tennis player from Mexico City who had gone there. And they needed a kicker. And he says, I know a guy who kicks the soccer ball pretty well. That was Septien, and he got a football scholarship. He drills Ooh, he this one. He got that one. Taken at the 18. It's Coleman at the 30, the 35, and out to the 42. So those two penalties did give the Oilers good field position and an excellent return as the kick was low. Don't forget, folks, tonight on NBC, Gary Coleman and a, is a cosmic whiz kid. Buck Rogers, 25th century. Then a doctor's greed causes a boy's death. Outraged Quincy wants to kill the system. And Kate discovers a corpse that walks on. And Kate loves a mystery. That's all tonight on NBC. Both wide receivers to the right. The Oilers trail 24-23. Earl Campbell. Oh, he draws about nine white jerseys to that spot off tackle. John Dutton was the first man there. Campbell is now in first place in the NFL with his rushing activity today. 122 yards in the first half put him up over the 1200 mark in fact he's close to 1300 yards on the season at this point second down eight wide receivers to the left Ken Burroughs back in the game Campbell breaks a tackle breaks another tackle well he turned a no gain into three and had he broken one more, he had no one else left downfield. One of the unique things about Earl Campbell is his body lean as he runs. You'll hear him talk about stay low to the ground. Watch Earl Campbell. Comes in, takes a hit from Larry Bethea right there, number 76, and is so low that Bethea just can't grab a hold of him. Comes out of that one, and it's the third man. Bounces off a second. It was finally the third man after slowing down that got him to the ground. From the perspective of 53 Bob Brunig watch him trying to fight the blockers 76 Morris Towns drives him back and he might say thank goodness I didn't have to get my head on Earl Campbell injured Ed Fisher leaves the field the right guard for the Oilers as we take a break 13 38 remaining the Oilers trail by one George Rainer number 64 back from the injured list has replaced Ed Fisher at right guard key third and four from the 47 for Houston fake to Campbell Pastorini has his arm hit and it's incomplete Aaron Kyle closest to the ball it was Larry Cole 63 who deflected the pass hitting the arm of Pastorini Harvey Martin was in on the play as well and the Cowboy fans are on their feet take a quick look at George Rainer number 64 his first snap as you said since returning difficult to come right off the bench step in against the man who's warm Larry Cole simply gets by him here lifts him up and gets the shot right there on Pastorini takes the blow on that arm and you've got to believe that some concern as to whether Pastorini may have been bounced hard enough to hurt that arm again we'll give you that Olympic address right after this kick by Parsley Wilson and Manning are deep Parsley hits another beauty. Wilson's going to let it go. And it goes into the end zone. You saw Manning say, let it go, and it does. First down at the 20 for the Cowboys. Again, here's the address again for your tax-deductible contribution to help our American Olympic athletes. It's U.S. Olympics, Post Office Box 1980N, Cathedral Station, Boston, Mass., 02118. Hope you'll feel a part of the Olympic program by your contribution. Dallas with a lead, 24-23, with 13 minutes remaining in this Thanksgiving football treat from Irving, Texas. And some of the folks are digging into the pumpkin pie right now. Ooh, a little whipped cream on top. Don't say that, Vic. You're making me hungry. 
Newhouse, the only back behind Staubach, and now Dorsett shifts with him. Staubach on first down to throw. Going long for Hill. Well covered. Who's got it? Houston, 33-yard line, J.C. Wilson, who was a roommate and friend of Tony Dorsett at Pittsburgh. So the Oilers continue the takeaway. They lead the AFC a plus 15, and there are three more today and have not given it up. I really don't understand that play. Roger put that ball in the air. It was up there all day. Maybe he just figured that Hill would go up and out muscle the defender, but Wilson does a great job of just grabbing that football, bringing it down. Hill wanted to go for the double reception rule, which would give the ball to the offense. The official there ruled it that the defender had taken control of the ball first. Number 33 will be credited with a, an interception, and Houston has the football. Renfro in motion, first down throw by Pastorini to Renfro and complete at the 43-yard line. Well, the pass did serve almost the same purpose as a kick, but it does give the Oilers the ball back immediately, and with plenty of time, 12-49 left, a one-point game, 24-23 Cowboys. J.C. Wilson, good-looking guy. He had on his uh, black cowboy hat last night he uh, in that big smile you were telling them some stories about the first black cowboy <laughs> it's kind of interesting I don't know if that was fact or fiction but it's no, was interesting. telling him the truth telling the truth about a bulldog who used to bite the ear or the lip of those uh, stairs when he took them down that'd be at least 15 yards in this game Campbell <laughs> out to the 35 yard line where it'll be third down and eight and the Cowboy fans are spurring on that defense. There's J.C. in his black outfit. He looks like he's ready to ride the range. Ken Burrow uh, in the lineup. We haven't seen Barber since his injury and the, the Oilers have been hurt today at that receiving core with some injuries. I'm sure have limited it to some degree the kinds of things that Pastorini has been able to do out on the field. Burrow comes limping out now, even though it's a pass situation. Ronnie Coleman is playing the slot left. Outside your picture, far left, is Richard Castor with Renfro to the right. Third and eight from the 35. Pressure's on. Pastorini guns it and completes it. What a throw by Pastorini to Barber. Mike Barber, the tight end back in there. And from a crowd, Pastorini shoots a dart. Well, we said we hadn't seen much of Barber, but uh, he is definitely well and alive. Pastorini stepping up, eluding a tremendous rush. Bethea, number 76, has a shot. Martin gets a piece. Pastorini zips it right there just in time. The ball thrown to Barber, who had two safeties draped all over him. Completion, rather remarkable at both ends. Good pass, great reception. Let's see if Houston can capitalize, keep that ball moving. Boy, the offensive caliber of play today has been superb. Campbell, Ooh. he had a head of steam. Oh, oh, oh. That is a punishing run, not a punishing tackle. That punishes the defense. He does get your attention. <laughs> From the end zone, you might get an appreciation for the force with which Campbell hit the line of scrimmage. That looked like Canadian football. He looked like he had a full, full head of steam. Watch him as he rounds off and comes back up the inside. They closed the hole. They didn't even slow him down. He went four or five yards with all those bodies stacked on top of him. Second and four at the Dallas 48. 10 minutes, 45 seconds left. Houston with the ball, trails by one. Wilson on a trap. Close to the first down. I believe he has it inside the 30 to check at the 44 of Dallas. John Dutton and Larry Cole made the tackle on that left side, a new left side of the Dallas line with Dutton starting for the first time and Cole in a tackle. They played well today. They have played well on that particular play. If you wonder why there was a little room inside, they faked outside to Campbell first. I don't blame people for leaning that direction. First down by Wilson near the 43 yard line. Caster started off the field, stays in. And Burrow now comes out as Tony Frisch with lots on his mind strolling the sidelines. They say about for now Pastorini calls time. There's some confusion in the huddle and Pastorini will spend a precious timeout in this situation with 10 minutes and 15 seconds left. Irving, Texas the scene, 24-23 Dallas. First down Houston at the Dallas 43. 10 minutes and 15 seconds left in the game. Dallas leads 24-23. Well, 
Wilson in motion. Campbell with the ball. Oh, almost fumbled. And he still picks up a couple of yards. Campbell with those two yards now has unofficially 182 today. That's the best rushing performance by any AFC back, bettering Campbell's own mark, 166 yards against the Redskins on opening day. And Campbell now is only 15 yards shy of the best game in the NFL this year. That by Wilbert Montgomery of Philadelphia, 197 versus the Browns. So Campbell, this is just not an ordinary day you're watching, folks. He's having a big afternoon and on his way to the best of the NFL year. Campbell again, cracking to the 39. Oh, he's paying the price. Every time he has the ball, he gets hit from every direction. Bruning, first man to get there, 53. Certainly doesn't fit the image of that middle linebacker, at least the image of the Nitschkes and the Butkuses or even the Jack Lamberts. So Bruning is the kind of the soft-spoken, easygoing, guitar-playing middle linebacker, very bright. And very aggressive. And he's not afraid to hit you. He may not be physically as, as strong or as big as many linebackers around, but he'll give you everything he has. Key third down. Houston is 5 for 11. Third down conversions. Rob Carpenter, no hole at all. Now, Pastorini does not throw the ball, stays on the ground, and the punting team comes on. Martin and Stalls led the defensive charge. A big play. Ball. That's a big play for the defense, too. I think Pastorini banking on the fact that everyone would be keying on number 34, Campbell. But he was surprised. Uh, they just played outstanding defense. Wouldn't take the bite. Stopped Carpenter. That's a big, big play. And I think, I think uh, Mike Ditka, special teams coach, has said, "Don't believe they're going to kick it. Check them out in there." Parsley with Bingham the up back. Manning goes it deep. He aims for the corner, and it goes out of bounds. Is down finally at the two. They say out of bounds at the 10-yard line, and a flag is down at the 13. Flag right. went down early. It's quite possible we have an illegal block down there. Or a uh, receiver uh, downfield uh, too soon. Wait, it may have, may have touched the Cowboys the way the Oilers are acting. Or wait, the penalty against Dallas could give Houston a first down. Oh, what a costly air. 12 men on the field for the Dallas Cowboys. That'll be a five-yard penalty. That'll be a first down. Tom Landry and a team who pride themselves on their precision. That's a very criti critical error. Unbelievable. Landry just simply explaining to you, Merlin, I don't know what it is, but it's some little thing always goes wrong, and it's never the same. I'm sure that's a new one. 12 men on the field. Gives the Oilers a first down at the 32. Gordon McCarter signals the illegal procedure. And that may be due to the many Dallas injuries or the fact that Henderson probably on the special teams and not here. Well, Houston still has to take advantage of the opportunity. They have the ball. They have it on the 33. They still need the points to go ahead this game. 24-23 Dallas. Fake to Campbell. Plenty of time. Burrow. Touchdown. Ken Burrow. turnaround the Dallas defense apparently stopping an oiler drive Ken Burrow injured a sore back right back with the big play and he played Benny Barnes you can't believe what he did to Barnes delaying just enough to keep Barnes out of position taking the ball on a pretty pretty pass from Dan Pastorini what a great touchdown Burrow shaking up an injured back in the first half returns to catch his fifth touchdown pass of the season. Here's Frisch's try for point. He missed the last one. That one right down the middle. Time out as Tony Frisch makes it 30 to 24 Houston. Let's watch Burrow again. He used his hands a little bit, didn't he? We've got to show you this pass. The, the, 
the fake right there to Campbell held it, but watch Burrow. You'll just see him stop briefly right here. Just kind of hung in the air and then broke away. Quickly again, another shot of Ken Burrow, and maybe you can see how he forced, maybe you can see what he does on the reception here. Watch him now, he'll get behind Barnes. He sees the ball, slow down right there, you see him? Forced Barnes to lose position and then accelerated to catch the football. That is such a smart play. It's no wonder that Burrow is one of the all-time great deep threats of the NFL. And there was no extra use of the hands. He just had them out there as a warding off a defender in basketball. Timeout. Houston is in the lead again. Dallas gets the ball after Ken Burrow's touchdown reception from Dan Pastorini. Houston leads 30 to 24. Frisch to kick it away. Here it comes. Bounces it down. 16. It's a reverse. Wilson to Brinson. And Larry Brinson takes it to the 31. Let's go back. What does an avid horticulturist, which Burrow is, do when he catches a touchdown pass? Well, here he is. Let's watch him catch the pass again first. And again, watch this very bright move right there. Just slowing down enough to get that position. Accelerating great catch. And then a horticulturist, well, he plants it. <laughs> that ought to grow. Boy, did he ever. Dallas with the football, with seven minutes and 43 seconds. Let's see if they can come back. This is Staubach at his best. He's at the 31 and gives the door set. Good blocking and a fine tackle by Stemrick to drop Dorsett at the 36. A gain of five. Second down, five yards to go. These Cowboys have not been fair weather performers. They have won three games in the final two minutes and have been brought back by Staubach. So the Oilers aren't safe yet. That six-point lead is less than a touchdown. And, boy, I'll tell you, that extra point still kind of looms up there as a critical factor in this ballgame. Larry, Larry Cole, Cole yeah. Joe Palooka, they called him when he first came to the big leagues from the University of Hawaii. The throw is complete. The door set, breaks a tackle, and gets the first down at the 46. Greg Bingham is standing over there with about a third of Dorsett's jersey, waving it like a flag. He, he got the jersey. He didn't get Dorsett. Again, Stavak looking away quickly back, trying to isolate Dorsett. Watch it right there. There you see it. Took about half the jersey. Did not get Dorsett. Ted Washington did, but not until Dorsett has a first down out of the Dallas 46. Plenty of time, six and a half minutes left. This may come down to who gets the ball last. Or set in motion. Newhouse. And Newhouse running gingerly, I thought. Merlin, he still has been bothered by that muscle injury in the leg. And then it became a, they examined after a couple of weeks, a stress fracture. And for the last two years, Newhouse really hasn't had healthy legs under him. You see how close the Euler decisions have been this year. They, too, have come from behind to win in the final seconds. We have two teams that will play it all the way to the wire. I'm afraid we may delay a few holiday dinners if things keep going the way they're going. At least the digestive process of some of these fans in the state of Texas. Second and seven. Staubach is back in the pattern. Pearson, first down at the Houston 36. motioning that he was inbounds, which was an unusual call. The clock is running, but I don't see how he could call that in play. He got hit one step before he went out of bounds. One of the great marks of a quarterback is being willing to hang on to that football until the last possible minute. You see the price they pay. Watch it again as you see Stavak taking all the time he can to give his receiver time to clear. Puts it right on target. Pearson taking it out of bounds with the first down. And the clock continued to run. Now down to five minutes. Under five. First down. Dallas trails by six. Newhouse behind Scott. Bingham from behind drags him down. Bingham has played another big game. A native of Chicago and operates a chain of car washes, does Greg? Chasing Newhouse and brings him down at the 33 after a gain of three. Clock ticking away down to 428, 427. 
Lots of pressure here on the defensive team for the Houston Oilers. They would love to come up with that football. Or at least force Dallas into just a field goal. Sabak intercepted twice. Only two of his passes, two of 24, have hit the ground. Dorsett hit in the backfield. That play slow getting off. And it was because of good defensive penetration by Andy Doris, who was injured earlier. But the seven-year veteran of New Mexico State works in the New Orleans Police Department in the offseason. Used to play with the Saints. Made a big defensive play, and it's now at the 36-yard line, third and ten. Tom Landry, he has not lost three games in a row since 1974. That's the year the Cowboys did not make the playoffs. Out of the spread, third and ten. Incomplete. A little too low for Jay Saldy and now on fourth down Landry has his toughest decision of this game. Houston Oilers coming up with a big play defensively. I think that's the worst pass we've seen Roger throw all day except maybe for the one he threw when he was going to the ground and the first time we've seen him throw badly when he did not have pressure. Dorsett comes in as Pearson also in. Except the end will not have a field goal chance. The Cowboys with three and a half minutes are going for it. Hill to the left, Pearson to the right, and now Saldi splits away to the right. Out of the spread, he needs 10. He gets it. Tony Hill, first down at the 20. They say that Tom Landry is an unemotional coach. Watch him right here. There it is. He knows that that was going to be caught. The drive is alive on the 20-yard line. Staubach in control. They want that touchdown. Boy, at Staubach, third down or fourth down conversions as he tough at the 20 of Houston. Two minutes and 40 seconds left. Dallas trails by six. Robert Brazil all in on the stop as the clock ticks down toward the two minute warning. Dallas may get one playoff before the official two minute warning. So for the Oilers, should Dallas drive in to score, they won't have much time to come back themselves. And the missed extra point does loom bigger and bigger. Big defensive play, great pursuit along the line. They tried to cut back, but the Oilers would not allow it. Second, nine and a half. They're not going to get call. a playoff. Nope. They're not even going to take wow. the play. They don't take a play. They let 26 seconds click off the clock. There is the official two-minute timeout. Two minutes left in this on a Thanksgiving evening now in the Dallas area. The score, the Houston Oilers 30, the Dallas Cowboys 24. So be with us, Sports World. Post-Thanksgiving treat, 4 o'clock Eastern time. Skating, bowling, weightlifting championships. Second down, nine. Dallas Cowboys have the football inside the Houston 20. The Oilers lead 30 to 24, just two minutes left. And the Cowboys are going to stay in the spread. Second down, nine. Good protection. Almost intercepted, then almost caught by Dorsett. It was number 51, Ted Thompson from SMU, who played his college football right here in the Dallas area, who almost picked it off. Thompson did a good job of reading the quarterback on that play, came, came across high in the air, had his fingers on the football. The Houston defense has inserted Ken Kennard, number 71, in place of Curly Culp. Kennard, a, a better pass rusher if Culp is tired, and certainly one of the stars, young stars of this team. They need to get more pressure on Roger. He has had time to throw that football. They can't afford that with just a minute and 56 seconds. They have got to get some pressure on him. You also saw Ted Thompson come out and Bill Courier has replaced him. Some confusion and timeout has been called. I don't know against whom that will be charged. Against the Dallas Cowboys, Dick. 156 remaining 
It's Dallas with the ball deep in Houston territory, six points behind. A lot of nervous faces. On that Houston sidelines by the offense, Tony Fish included. He'd like to see that defense save face for him. His missed extra point gives Dallas a chance to win it. They trail by six. They have the football third down and nine at the 19. Our thanks today to Joe Costanza, our statistician Doug Adams from KXAS, Blake Burns uh, station here, NBC station in Dallas, John Nelson, Mike Weissman, and Teddy Nathanson down in the truck with those excellent pictures. Pearson to the left, both Pearsons. Drew outside, Preston in the slot. And now Preston moves back into the backfield. In the end zone, incomplete. Tony Hill and that one just missed connections. And I think Staubach thought he should have had, yes, his Ooh. actions tell a story. He thought he had a touchdown. There, no question that Roger felt that that could have been a completion. Watch Staubach here. Has to wait a little bit for the snap, but he has time again to throw, put that ball on target, and let's watch. He'll tell right there. He thought it could be caught. Oh, Doug. He's not going to blame anyone, though. He's a real gentleman. He's a real champion, and he's got one more shot down there. Tom Landry, who calls the plays, and he's motioning for Staubach to come over. So the Cowboys are going to spend another time out here. Well, they might, because even though there's 151 left, they have only one play to get nine yards for a first down to sustain the drive. And the other thing this has done, Merlin, should the Cowboys succeed and score with these incomplete passes, Houston would get the ball again with time to move themselves. Tony Fritz got to be feeling better, but the pressure's still building. They made it on a big fourth down call earlier, but it's tougher down here. You're down into an area where the field is not very big, and you have a lot of defenders on your people. You don't have as far to go to the football tougher to pass down in this area than it is out on the field a little bit further. Staubach's going to have his hands full getting it into the end zone. i got to believe that this whole thing is built to a magnificent crescendo here in this, in this stadium, and I don't think anybody has left here to go home. I wouldn't think so. There may be a little crispy drumsticks in some of the households. Tom Landry looks to the scoreboard. It spells out the situation. Fourth and nine. A minute 51 seconds left. Ron Springs and Preston Pearson behind Staubach, not in the spread. He's under center. Incomplete, and look at that Oilers sidelines. You've heard of the turkey truck? Well, the Oilers have their own Thanksgiving dance going. It appeared that Staubach's intended receiver, too well covered, he couldn't find an open man. I don't understand, though, why he didn't pull it down and try and run it or try and do something else. The ball thrown just apparently out of bounds, senseless on a fourth down play. Kind of sad in a way, a day that has been such a great one for Staubach in throwing the football to end on a play like that. Tony Frisch says, well, you know, if they'd have scored a touchdown, we'd have had time to get in field goal range and how to kick one for the Oilers anyway. Now, Houston trying to run out the clock. Earl Campbell just into the center of things. And Dallas, forced to use two timeouts, now spends its last. Larry Bethea made the tackle. Got to say, Dick, this has just been one fantastic football game. They don't all live to the expectations that we have for them. But coming into the top of this show, we talked about great running from Campbell and Dorsett, great passing from Staubach and Pastorini, and we have had all that and more. Let's see how the Oilers put pressure on Roger, that fourth down and nine play. Staubach getting the pressure from a four-man rush, does not have anyone downfield, look quickly to the sideline, just flipped that ball, would not have had much time. Andy Doris, 69, had broken clear of right field right. Number 70, the veteran at right tackle. That has to be a sad end to, to what was a very fine drive. It's been a tough week for this Dallas Cowboy organization, a tough month. And you've got to wonder what this does to Tom Landry and these Cowboys. They wanted this victory so much. The ball flying out of bounds kind of symbolizes the almost futility 
of their last four ball games, now five ball games. Campbell bowls his way out across the 25, and now the clock will run. There's no way the Cowboys can stop it. Quick look, though, at Dallas. They still can control their destiny. If they win the rest of their games, they will win their division. I beg your pardon. We had charged the Cowboys with a timeout that apparently must have gone against Houston. So the Cowboys spend a timeout. They now have no more. 133 left. Should Dallas lose, that means Philadelphia and Washington have a chance on Sunday to move into sole possession or share first place. And meanwhile, Houston puts the pressure on the Pittsburgh Steelers. If Houston wins, the Steelers, Super Bowl champs, must beat Cleveland at home on Sunday. You'll see that game on NBC starting at 12.30 NFL 79 on Sunday, and that's a great way to start your football afternoon. So with four games to go, and now only three for the Cowboys and Oilers, this one uh, a bit of a surprise. The Cowboys were favored to win. And yet Dallas, by their own admission, they won against the Giants. If they lose this one, should have lost five in a row. Most unusual for this Dallas organization. Can they rebound? Well, I think Dallas, uh, and especially Coach Landry and his staff, will spend this long week trying to ask the question and answer it. What is wrong with the Dallas Cowboys? A minute 33 left. Pastorini only needs to fall on the ball, but he gives to Earl Campbell instead. And Campbell stretching for a first down out to the 31-yard line. And it's all over now as the Oilers celebrate some more. You say it's a holiday where we give thanks. <laughs> Bum Phillips, as he said, I don't mind the short week as long as it's not a long day. But the length of the day belongs to the far sidelines. The long shadows grow on the cowboy bench. Campbell. 196 yards today unofficially that would be one shy of Montgomery's best rushing effort of this NFL season the Philadelphia running back with 197 and now just formation fall down and let the clock run Bob Phillips Oilers are going to be the first 10 game winner in the NFL they've come north to Dallas and for them, a sweet victory, as you mentioned at the top of the show, Merlin, for so many reasons. Now they felt that they had been treated a little shabbily, sometimes even by their own press. They are genuinely proud of what they have done in this year. They fought very hard for their victories. They fought hard for this victory. It did not come easily either. And it's time, perhaps, that they be recognized for their success. Bob Phillips, you got to love the man. Boy, he is absolutely unique among NFL coaches. Three. Two, one, the final gun. Thanksgiving Day in Texas belongs to the Houston Oilers. Houston 30, Dallas 24. We'll be right back at Texas Stadium after this word. Take care of your car at Kmart. Our automotive service centers care. Now here's something that anyone can use. Our best quality 40-piece standard and metric socket wrench set. A combination one-quarter and three-eighths drive with a full unconditional duration warranty. Just $17.88 now through November 24th at Kmart Automotive Centers across the U.S. Where quality car products are Kmart priced. Holidays were made for Michelob. Hi. Holidays were made for special friends. A great shot of the man with a ball, and he played with it as if he owned it. He led the Houston Oilers to a 30-24 win, rushed for nearly 200 yards. Earl Campbell, despite the fact that the Cowboys, who led early most of the first half and at halftime, 21-17 and had a chance to win themselves in the...